It's day two of the Grand National Meeting and BBC Two now joins Julian Wilson at Aintree. It's the calm before the storm at Aintree. The great race is just 24 hours away and the preparations are well advanced. They crossed the Melling Road just 200 yards after the start in the Grand National and again two fences from home. For the rest of the week, it's a major roadway. Well, already there have been several twists in the Grand National plot. The fields are smaller since 1970, but the race is still full of mystery. We still don't know the favourite, let alone the winner. But one thing that looks certain is that the ground will be riding fast, although it's perfect at present. And the betting market, well, that reflects the changing pattern of the race in the past 10 days. A week ago, Rough Quest was still to be confirmed a certain runner. The favourite then was Lo Stragoni. He's now out of the race, as are three others who were leading contenders at that time. Lo Stragoni, favourite then at 9-1, to one. other absentees, Royal Athlete, Tartan Tarrant, and... Uh, of course, Dextra Dove. Now, Rough Quest is confirmed a runner in the last week and is clear favourite. But Easing, having been as low as 4-1 to one at one stage, to 6-1. to one. And he's being pressed in the market by several horses, Superior Finish and Young Hustler at 7-1, to one, Son of War at 8-1, to one, Party Politics 9, Deep Bramble and Life of the Lord are both 10-1. to one. Then it's 16-1 to one, Wild Hyde, 20, Lusty Light and Encore and Purr, and 25, Bishop's Hall and Rust Never Sleeps. So, Rough Quest, an uneasy favourite at 6-1, to one, but that lack of confidence isn't shared by his jockey, Mick Fitzgerald, who I spoke to earlier. Mick, 24 hours to go, are you still as bullish as you were after the Gold Cup about Rough Quest? Yes, very much so. Like, uh, nothing's really changed. The ground probably is not ideal, I'd like it to be soft, but it's still good ground out there, and I think it's, I think everything's still on course. But you must have reservations about his staying the trip. You'd have to have, because he's never done it before. Obviously, you've got that doubt in the back of your mind. A horse having never travelled four and a half miles, it is a little bit of a doubt, but he's, he's such a good horse, he relaxes once he settles into a race, and I can't really see him being a problem. You know, he's got the three and a quarter and a very competitive race like the Gold Cup very quite well, so I think he'll get the trip. And what about the fences? Because he has fallen twice this year at, at Cheltenham and Leopardstown. Yeah, he was very, very unlucky at Cheltenham when I rode him. It was a horrible day. It, it hadn't stopped raining overnight and the, the ground was quite slippy. And it was the last ditch and I, I've gone into it and I've gone to just like, get him to pop. And he's as he's gone to, to pop, he's, he slipped behind and just fell right into the ditch and turned over. It was a very, very unlucky fall. And then at Leopardstown when Richard Dunwoody rode him, he is a portable fence on that course that day and it was quite tight for room and they hadn't done much of a gallop and they'd suddenly picked up the pace and it was five horses trying to get into a four horse gap and he was just crowded out of it and he'd nowhere to go so he was been unlucky more than anything you were unlucky yesterday in your first race round these fences and cue to fable fell at the first what happened um, well, basically, we'd been stood on the tape for too long, and he'd, he'd gone to sleep a little bit on me. The trouble is, it's very difficult to get a horse to line up on the tape and then bounce out and go. It's, it's bad enough, but then when you're actually stood down there for quite a while and then trying to get go, he felt like a, a diesel car in third gear going down to the first. I just couldn't quite get him on the, the button for me so that I could set him up, and then I've gone to the first and met him on a perfect stride and squeezed him in to pick up and he's put down because he's not quite switched on yet and unfortunately he's, he's, he's fallen. Are you worried about the start of tomorrow's Grand National that something similar might happen? Well, obviously you'd be worried about it because it, 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 it's happening a little bit too much 
but at the same time, Jerry Scott is a very, very good starter. Um, I have every confidence in him, and with a field of 28, hopefully it'll be it'll be a lot easier for him. You know, it's no easy job being a starter, and I certainly wouldn't like the job. But it, they're trying to be fair to everybody, and I think it it should work okay. You know, with 28, and it's a good start over there. I can't see there being any problem. Nick Fitzgerald, the rider of tomorrow's big race favourite, Rough Quest. Well, the horse whose price has really plummeted in the last week is the Irish trained Son of War. And Sue Barker's been checking him out. I'm here in the stables, and yes, one of the first arrivals for the big race from Ireland is Son of War. First of all, travelling companion with Son of War, the stable lad, Colin Foley. Colin, how did he travel? Travel great, the best I've seen. Travel great, yeah. First time on a plane, but very good, yeah. And it's obviously a big occasion. Is he aware of it yet? Oh, or yes, is it sunk he is, in? yes, he knows, yeah. He knows what he's here for. And what's his sort of personality? Is he a bit of a monkey? Or no, he's he? quite... He's Takes it all in. And what's his schedule between now and the big race? I just have a walk out and just let him soak it in, like, while he's here, you know. Great. Well, also uh, here, trainer Peter McCreary. And Peter, I mean, your first runner in the national, first runner at Aintree. What's the first impression? It's a great place and just delighted to be here, and especially with a horse with a live chance. What about the course? Have you uh, had a chance to have a good look around? Not a good look around yet, but uh, haven't looked at it from television. It's a, it's a great track. And, you know, it'll suit him well. Yeah, and the ground? The ground won't worry him. He won't worry about the ground. It's drying out, but that, that'll suit him just as well. It's quite a family tra tradition, this race, in a way, isn't it? Your, your grandfather, Tom Taft, trained a winner. That's right. Uncle Pat Taft rode two winners. Yeah, hopefully we can carry on the tradition. <laughs> great if we could, yeah. Are you a nervous uh, watcher? <laughs> ah, no, no, no. Like, you can only do so much, and what will be will be. We can't do any more now at this stage. What do you hope for him tomorrow? Oh, I hope that he'll be in the winner's enclosure. <laughs> <laughs> hope so. We wouldn't be here if we, if we didn't. <laughs> <laughs> hope so, too. Good yeah, luck tomorrow. Thanks very much, Sue. Thank you. Son of War, who's bidding to become the first Irish trained winner of the race for 21 years. Over £60 million is expected to be bet on the national tomorrow, despite the national lottery. Well, we've got a terrific programme on day two here at Liverpool. Today's racing dominated by the Mum Melling Chase. There's only a field of four, but the three principals finished first, second and third in the Queen Mother Champion Chase. We're in for a real treat here. And today's race over the big fences, the Martell Fox Hunters Chase, the Amateur Riders Grand National. And a couple of non-runners later in the afternoon, sadly, in the Fox Hunters last year's winner, number 20, Sure Jest, is a non-runner. And in the 20 past four, number 14, Uncle Keeney, who ran in the last race yesterday, he also is an absentee. And after day one is Tony McCoy, who's in pole position for the Ritz Club Charity Trophy, which goes to the leading rider over the three days. Well, we previewed our first race. They'll go back to Tony McCoy, because Tony rode his double on the first day, and uh, this was how he completed it, in a terrific finish for the last race, going to the last riding top spin. As you can see, he's only in fourth or fifth place. Great battle up front, Jathid, the gambled on horse on the stand side. Uncle Keeney, who made a mistake on the far side. And top spin coming from well off the pace from Tony McCoy. It looked here as though Woody was going to land the gamble on Chuck Eve, but Tony McCoy cuts him down all through the last 100 yards of the race to get up in the very final strides to land his big price double. So that put him head of the list for the Ritz Club. He overnight was the leader with two winners, followed by Jonathan Lower, Lorcan Wire, Peter Nevin, Paul Carberry, and Mr. Clive Story. Well, the top trainers, well, no trainer saddled more than one winner so far. The ones that have done so are David Nicholson, Martin Pipe, Tim Easterby and Thomas Tate, Howard Johnson, Jane Story and John Jenkins. Well, I'm pleased to welcome Norman Williamson as my guest again today. Norman, sad to see our older Brook, your old friend, he's retired for the season. He is, he's, uh, he's off, um, but the ground is drying up all the time and I'm sure if we don't get rain tonight, um, there would have been no point in running him and I think it's for the best. Sure. And Adrian Maguire likewise? Adrian Maguire likewise spoke to Mr Nicholson yesterday and he said he's quite happy actually that Adrian is forgetting about it because he just thinks he's better come back next season fresh and ready to go, hopefully both of us together. Great, well we'll look forward to that. The Martel 
Mersey Novices Hurdle was the first race of the day. The favourite here was Simply Dashing. Well fancy to give Timmy's to be his second winner of the meeting. He missed Jeltenham because he had suffered from a virus. So he was a fresh horse, the red colours and the white sash. Non-runners here were Tom Brody and Jack Tanner at the off Simply Dashing. In fact, easy to back on the course out to 5-2. to 9-2 to two in defence, 9-2 to two also all-time dancer. 7-1 to one Escart Vig trained by Martin Pipe, 9 to 1 Ashwell Boy, 11 to 1 Hooded Hawk, 12 to 1 Shredded Silver Shred, also trained by Martin Pipe, 20 to 1 Jays, 100 to 1 Northern Charmer and Streaky Hawk. Now we had a full start here, but uh, I don't think too much should be read into it. Norman, what happened? I think it really Julian is just a horse on the inside here, as far as I know it's Warren Marsden, just there, got his head caught in the tape, and the starter rightly had to let the tape go. Um, just look at it, I don't, I don't think they're giving the starter much of a chance, they're being a bit close to the tape, but um, there's, a, there's not a lot they can do, he just had to let go. Not, not a lot there. We pick it up three from home, and Peter O'Sullivan's the commentator. Coming down towards the second last, Escort Feig and all-time dancer, and on the near side, Ashwell Boy. Very little between the leading trio now as they come down towards the final flight with Silver Shred the Grey trying to get on terms as well. But on the near side, it's Ashwell Boy who's going to jump in the lead. Ashwell Boy lands over the last in the lead from Escort Feig, and then comes Silver Shred racing up towards the line. And as they come into the final hundred yards, it's Ashwell Boy being challenged all the time by Silver Shred. Silver Shred beginning to get up. And at the line, Silver Shred has got up and won it from Ashwell Boy with third escort feet. A brilliant finale that by the grey Silver Shred under Jonathan Lower. Gets up in the closing stages to win this Martel Mersey Novices hurdle. So, first and third for Martin Pipe, the winner, number nine, Silver Shred, 12 to 1. Second, number three, Ashwell Boy, 9 to 1. And third, number eight, Escart Vig at 7 to 1. So, a dramatic win for Jonathan Lower there, winning the first race of the day for the second day in succession. Now he shares the lead with Tony McCoy in the Ritz Club Trophy. And Norman, what's that on his nose? Yes, I saw Graham Bradley inside. These are is it is new did like a plaster over your nose and um it's supposed to help your breathing your airways uh, graham bradley i said to him he looks like robbie fowler playing football but um <laughs> it'll be interesting to see what they think it just shows you how professional the game is getting really but what's it supposed to do it's just supposed to help your air airways I, I believe some people wear them in bed at night to people that snore and all the rest of these guys are definitely not going to bed with them on um but they are getting very professional and it, it, it just shows you what the game is like oh, better tell richard Pittman about it Right, well, the fat men have the best of things on the first day and indeed in the first race here today. Graham Rock, what's happened in the offices this morning? Well, we've had eight races so far, just one winning favourite, and if it goes on like this much longer, there won't be many people left down here in the ring to bet. But now, our most valuable race today, the Mum Melling Chase, there's been good money this morning for some, all four of the runners, in fact, including the outsider, Coulton, who has been gambled on from 14 to 1 down to 10 to 1. Karen Davis 15 to 8, Sam Round 2 from 9 to 4, Viking Flagship 9 to 4 from 5 to 2, and you can get 2 to 1 Karen Davis here on the course. And in our next race, the uh, Mum Malbane obviously Chase Hill of Tullow 9 to 4, Labrooks there into 15 to 8. Good money for Addington Boy, Fours into 7 to 2, and a little money there for the outsider at the wag 25 to 1 into 20 to 1. 3.45, looks wide open on paper, there's been a gamble here, rolling ball, 5 to 1, into 3 to 1, a lot of money for him, there's some money too for Dark Dawn, 10s into 9, Claire Mann, 14 into 12, and Southern Minstrel, 33 to 1, into 20 to 1. This is probably one of the strongest betting races of the day, Turnpole, 4s into 7 to 2, and Blaze Away, 12 into 10, and Wisley Wonder, that was widely backed throughout, 16 to 1 into 10 to 1 and later on good gambles too on golden hello 16 into 12 and top seas 5 to 1 into 3 to 1 one of the best horses back today Graham, thank you. There's an official change in the going on the second day. The going on the Mildmay course is now officially good and good to firm in places. It remains perfect ground on the national course. And so to the top race of the second day, the Mum Melling Chase. Only four of them, but what a race. Peter O'Sullivan. Over 37,000 uh, to the winning owner here. Winners of 59 races between them, this quartet. 
Number one is Colton, written by Jimmy McCarthy. Two is Claren Davis from Ireland, written by Frank Woods. Three, Sound Man from Ireland, written by Richard Dunwoody. And four, Viking flagship, written by Tony McCoy. Here's how they better the moment. And Soundman, change of favourite here, 15 to 8, clear favourite now. Claren Davis was favourite this morning. Soundman now heads the market at 15 to 8. Claren Davis and Viking flagship, both 9 to 4 from 2 to 1. 8 to 1, Colton, the outsider of 4. So Viking flagship superseded in the batting. He was voted Cartier Chaser of the Year last season, largely on the strength of his thrilling success in this race 12 months ago. What a brilliant race this was. Norman, you'll remember it as well as anyone, I'm sure. And with three horses coming to the last in line and, and the yellow colours on the inside, uh, deep sun se that sensation, he had to dig deep here. It was this well, it was an, an amazing race, Julian. I think I got beat, but it must be the race of my life. Um, Viking flagship in the middle shows how game and tough he is. Landed in front here and I thought I'd win, but it really was just something else. Keeps battling back. Um, Adrian Maguire first, first and second, myself and himself, and um, none of us here today. You kind of thought you wouldn't be in the first two there. <laughs> but what a horse he is, but uh, two weeks ago he went to Cheltenham, defend his title there, and uh, once again he was involved in the race of the meeting. Running down towards the third last, sound man nearest the camera, Viking flagship the centre, and on the far side, Claire on Davis, they can, oh, they ploughed through at the leaders, sound man made a bad mistake on the near side, Viking flagship wasn't fluent either, and Claire on Davis lost ground as well, they're clear of strong platinum as they run down towards the second last, Viking flagship in the centre, just gets his nose in front now, of sound man who once again went through the top of it, three links then to Claire, Claire on Davis, a gap to strong platinum as they come towards the turn, one left to jump in the Queen Mother Champion, chase and it's Viking flagship the near side far side is sound man as they round the corner now in behind them clear on Davis battling on and they're nicely clear they come up towards the last and here's clear on Davis the near side putting in giant strides now three in line coming to the last clear on Davis the near side jumps at best of all goes about a neck in front of Viking flagship and sound man 150 yards left to go they're on the run in and clear on Davis is now starting to assert clear on Davis under the whip starting to draw clear of Viking flagship and sound man and clear on Davis goes on to win the Queen Mother Champions chase in great style second Viking flagship and third sound man Claire and Davis pouncing late there but so effectively what a wonderful race that was but today there's an extra half mile the grounds a little bit faster Norman what's going to happen it really is it's an exciting race Claire on Davis a lot of people worried about the ground I think if a horse, it depends on which horse comes out of Cheltenham best, really. He looks like he's at Claire on Davis, the one they all have to beat again. But Viking flagship, he'd come out of Cheltenham. He will be the toughest not to crack, I think, on the day. And again, you can't count out sound man. I spoke to Edward O'Grady this morning, and he said he's, he's in terrific form. So I think we're in for a thrilling race between three top two-mile chasers. He pays your money, he takes your choice. Let's join Richard Pittman and Peter Scudamore. Yes, as Norman said, it is a fascinating race. I think what the, the interest... The the interesting thing is that Claren Davis, who we're seeing here in your pictures, he made a terrible mistake at the ditch, Richard. He banked the ditch, and he did really well to uh, stay up, and Francis Woods did really well to stay on board the horse. In fact, he didn't do it, lose a lot of ground. The two principles, the whole race had been built up around Sound Man and Viking Flagship, and I think they got to the top of the hill, and they've had a look at each other, and they've zoomed down the hill, and they didn't jump. Throughout the race, the two horses that usually all season have jumped really well didn't jump as well as they can this day and they made mistakes down the hill so it would just be interesting today a different tempo perhaps Colton will make the race to the uh, running today uh, that day uh, Jamie dropped him right in he, I expect they'll be looking for Jimmy McCarthy to make the running so it's just the whole race is, is, is a has a different uh, ingredient in it today, but I was most impress impressed with Karen Davis. He really did quicken up well that day. But what we must remember, this is an extra half mile today. I was, and of course, they've all come from Cheltenham. Which has taken the race best? Here is Sound Man. Sadly, one of his part owners in the colours he runs in, David Lloyd, is not actually here. His helicopter has broken down, had to land in a field at Coventry, so he'll be somewhere in a hotel now, glued to the box. 
13 to 8 from 7 to 4. That's uh, where the money is going, sound man. What a lovely horse. We've seen him on decent ground at Ascot. He's a very, very good horse. Claren Davis uh, was his better at Cheltenham a year ago, too, in the Arkle Chase and improved his superiority this year. But this one cannot be ruled out. Two and a half miles on a different track. The, the whole crux of the matter is which horse has come out of Cheltenham best. And the other thing about Sound Man, if he's been fantastic and he jumped so well for Richard and Woody, he has been travelling backwards and forwards across, to, to he's run at Sandown, he's run at Ascot across here, will that, and he's run at Cheltenham, will that travelling uh, have taken more out of him than the rest? Last year's winner, of course, Viking flagship, there he is, what a great horse, he's won two mile, two champion two mile chases just sweating there behind the saddle i don't mind that skew i think that that shows he's just keyed up enough to do the business right, now Island, over this two and a half mile trip he will not give in no Ready he's in he's tough Ready he didn't front. jump as well as he did at to tell them just watching there colton does front. look a, as if he's going to make the running jimmy mccarthy lining right up against the tape and peter will tell you just how fast he goes 16 to be jumped this time Prize of nearly 4,000 to the fourth here, and over 37,000 to the winning owner, 15,000 to the second. And they're coming in now, the other three to join Colton. Little uh, hesitation there by uh, Viking flagship. Colton standing very calmly, waiting for the others to join him. Viking flagship just backing away, being a little bit mulish for Tony McCoy at the moment. Just uh, taking a turn right, as he's you led. Back on the outside, please. And uh, Jerry Scott has You're asked him to be taken up, to the outside. Straight up right, to your other two, he says. Right. All right, Carnick! This looks like it. And they're away, and Colton jumps straight into uh, quite a substantial lead from Viking flagship Sound Man and Claren Davis, the back marker. And that's how they jumped the first of the 16 fences. Coming to another plain one, Colton, well clear, ensuring a really serious pace here as he races now towards the first of the ditches number three colton from viking flagship sound man and claren davis at the ditch colton oh he wasn't foot perfect at that but he was all right coming to the fourth clear of viking flagship once again he's it was safe, but uh, not spectacular. Swinging left-handed. Got about a 10-length lead, too, at least. And stretching. From Viking flagship and Sound Man, and then Claire and Davis. And this is the fifth of the 16 fences in all. Colton, the outsider of the quartet, jumps that very well indeed. Viking flagship jumped in second, Sound Man third. A little gap then to Claren Davis. As the leader swings into the home straight on the first circuit. Another plain one before the second ditch. Colton over the sixth. From Viking flagship, Sound Man and Claren Davis. Second of the ditches now. Colton, Viking flagship, Sound Man and Claren Davis. Running down to the one that'll be the last next time. You'll just see the chair in the in the foreground. Should be number 15 tomorrow in the national. This is the eighth now. Beautiful jump by the leader. In fact, they all jumped that extremely well. That gap has been reduced to about five lengths. Colton, the leader from Viking flagship and Sound Man, and stalking Sound Man is Claire and Davis. So it's Jimmy McCarthy in the lead from Tony McCoy, then Richard Dunwoody, followed by Frank Woods. So entering the backstretch now, Colton from 
Viking flagship and son man and Claren Davis. Number nine. Elton, Viking flagship, son man, Claren Davis. Number ten, Colton. Viking flagship, son man and Claren Davis. Third of the ditches now, the eleventh. Colton over that ditch from Viking flagship, son man and Claren Davis. Five from home now. Colton, Viking flagship, Sound Man, and Claren Davis as they swing left handed out of the back stretch. Colton being tracked still by Viking flagship, was getting closer all the time. Four from home now. Colton from Viking flagship. Colton, a beautiful jump there in the lead. Colton stretches that advantage over Viking flagship, who's got a four-length lead over Sound Man, who's got a two-length lead over Claren Davis, who's being rousted along and not making a lot of progress. Coming down now towards the third last in the Mum Melling chase, and as they do so, it's Colton being pressed now by Viking flagship. The little between them, Viking flagship has taken it up now as he comes down to the final ditch. It's Viking flagship, two from home, in the lead from the fading Colton and then Sound Man. Coming down towards the final fence now in the Mum Melling chase. And it's the old champion, Viking flagship, really stretching him now as he comes to the final fence. Colton is second, and Sound Man finishing strongly in third. At the final fence, though, Viking flagship has surely only got a jump it. He gets a tremendous cheer from the crowd. Viking flagship as he strides away from Sound Man. And as they come to the line, Viking flagship wins the Mum Melling chase. Sound Man is second, the gallant Colton is third. And the disappointing winner of the Queen Mother champion chase, Claren Davis, is fourth. And so the result of the 1996 Mum Melling chase is first number four, Viking flagship, owned by Roach Foods Limited, trained by David Nicholson and written by Tony McCoy. Second was number three, Sound Man, owned by Mr. David Lloyd, trained by Edward O'Grady in Ireland and written by Richard Dunwoody. And third was number one, Colton, owned by Mr. M.G. St. Quinton, trained by Oliver Sherwood and written by Jimmy McCarthy. Viking flagship, the five to two winner of the Mum Melling Chase. Oh, delighted Superb race. Delighted scenes there. Jeremy, the travelling head lad, patting Tony McCoy. And here they come to the last. What a great exhibition, exhibition of jumping. Sure this horse will get further, Richard. I'm absolutely sure. But hadn't Colton jumped today? Remember that nasty fall at Ascot. And today he's got in close to one. But other than that, he has really set them alight and has run a great race. He's bred by Walter Moriti on Julian Wilson's advice. I think Julian was getting very excited there. Claren Davis was first to weaken. Sound Man has run a very good race once again, but superb jump. It puts Tony McCoy, the head of the Ritz Club trophy, but once again Colton, named after a village in North Yorkshire, has put in a good jump there, but in the end has now had to give best to Sound Man. But Viking flagship, who had to fight for his victory last year, Skew, has got an easier one today. Yeah, they've got a, a really good gallop, Colton I thought they'd let Colton off too far. He's a good enough horse that you wouldn't want to be that far in front. Uh, and uh, it was a great performance by Viking Flagship. I mean, that's as good a performance as we've seen over fences uh, this season, including Imperial Calls uh, uh, race in the Gold Cup. Uh, sound man, he just didn't jump. That's twice now that his jumping has let him down in, in, in the high-pressure races. He's a very, very good horse when he's dictating, but today he wasn't able to uh, lay up. And... Uh, as we said, uh, Norman and I and you were discussing that uh, uh, this horse, surely we get the three mile somewhere like Kempton, the King George has got to be a possible target for him, I remember him as a novice and he was a staying type then So, Viking flagship wins his 21st race out of 42 public appearances. Tony McCoy, 135 winners this season, now clear 
in the Reds Club Charity Trophy with three winners at the meeting. enthusiastic applause for this marvellous son of Viking at a fourth degree by Oates. What a star he is. Just has his own ideas. He, uh, he was just a, a little bit uh, a little bit hesitant about uh, going up to the tape today at the outset of the race and then he hesitated before entering the winner's circle which is done very sweetly now. He's like to do things obviously in his own time. As the Duke, David Nicholson, after his 66th winner of the season, marvelous omen that for Tony McCoy, who rides deep bramble tomorrow in the big one. Meanwhile, the starting prices on the Mum Melling Chase as follows. And Viking flagship, the winner at five to two. Second sound man gambled on down to six to four. And third Coulton at eight to one. On the tote there, the win two pounds eighty. The dual forecast two pounds seventy. And the straight forecast, Viking flagship to beat Soundman, six pounds twenty-five. What a wonderful race! What a wonderful exhibition of jumping! Our hearts go out to Adrian Maguire, who's missed the ride, but uh, likewise, what a terrific ride Tony McCoy gave this horse, Norman. Very it special was. today, wasn't it? It was, and I'm, I'm delighted he won because really, I, I said at Cheltenham I thought he'd win, and I think today he proved that he came out of Cheltenham probably the toughest horse. Um, you know, he got the trip, he jumps, he gallops, he was super. Claire and Davis beat a long way out, um, sound man made a bad mistake down the back, but really no, no excuse um, for them. Look at McCoy. the joy on Tony's face, and from the moment he pulled up, I mean, he was just revving 110 revs, wasn't he? And the Duke, quite word. <laughs> All right. <laughs> well, now, sound man today, his jumping let him down. Yes, uh, Jimmy McCarthy on Coulton gave him a super ride along in front, jumped jump very well today. And um, just see sound man just in the, in the middle on the outside. Richard just squeezes him up, then just sits tight. In he goes, in too close, and really, he should nearly have fell there. Um, did the same thing at Cheltenham, and I think at the end of the day, it's bound to knock the stuffing out of a horse in a top-class race like this. But full marks to Oliver Sherwood for getting Coulton so well. Yes, he loves this place, the old horse, and uh, he won here over hurdles, won last year, of course. Uh, he put down once in the first circuit, but there he is with his ears pricked. It, it just suits him round here on the ground, of course, and Jimmy McCarthy, and Jimmy always really stood back from there. Long, the long there. way away, <laughs> and uh, Sam Mann did the same thing. But you can see Tony McCoy just niggling along there, and he's, he's at this all the way around, and it shows the way the horse just keeps going. He's an amazing horse, he really is. And the one horse who was never going, Claire and Davis at the back, and the ground a bit fast, I suppose. Ground probably a little bit quick, Julian, yes. Um, maybe didn't come out of Cheltenham so well, but he was a bit keen early as well, and um, maybe he's just a top two mile, two mile chaser on softer ground. Now they're starting to draw together and uh, Claire and Davis wasn't too clever at that one but you think uh, any one of the front three could win here? Yes again I think Richard just dropped sound man in a little today and uh, just to make sure he'd get to two and a half miles but he looks to be traveling great but Tony you can see just niggling along a bit Jimmy McCarthy in front on coot and he's still pricking his ears and I think when a horse is doing that you've got to be a little bit worried that he mightn't stop you can see him revved him up for a good jump and did jump it well again sound man missed again Claire on Davis is beat at this stage but Jimmy here, he's just trying to hold on to a bit and still keep stretching the one behind. He really got them on the stretch with that good jump there, turning in. Claren's beaten now, Sound Man's definitely struggling. And just for a moment, Tony McCoy was niggling, but he's the one who's got the response. He has, and the more he has, the more Viking flagship delivers. Here he goes again. You know, wonderful jump, and Land's running away from the back of the fence. That was the crunch. Colton put in a short one there, and he's gone into it a length and a half down, come out of it in front, and, and now there's only one winner. There is. I don't think Colton really has slowed down behind. I think the other horse has just quickened up a bit. Again, the way he's jumping in front, he's just giving fences loads of height, and he must have a lot of, lot of petrol still left in the tank. 
Well, last year you came to the last upside and there's nothing within eight lengths of him now. And uh, Tony, he's not going to mess about here, is he? He's not messing about and he, he gave him a great, you know, he's, he's riding with so much confidence, it's unbelievable. And down to the last fence, he never stopped riding, kept squeezing him up. And very long, yeah, so I'm sure oh. if he were standing at the last fence, he's a mile away from it. Same with Coulton, just dived a bit and sound man just out battled him. Um, but really the winner, he's had, he's had won from a long way out. Well, a wonderful moment for David Nicholson, his second winner of the meeting. And of course, the new team, he and Tony McCoy have uh, really clicked with Adrian McGuire out of action. They're now with Jonathan Powell. Yes, with me, Tony McCoy. You've just been watching the end of that race again. Have you ever had a better ride? I've never had a better ride, and I probably never will have a better ride. Um, unbelievable horse. I mean, down the back, I, I wasn't really travelling. And when I turned out the back the last time, I just started to squeeze him up, and I could feel him picking up. And I knew the minute I'd grab a hold of him that whatever was going to come with me would have to be tough and, and very, very good. Um, and the way he's jumped the last three fences, I mean, he's full of himself. Super horse. Um, got a chance to see him going to the last again, Tony. You've got your race one with a good jump. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, he's got so much scope. He didn't travel that well early on, but it wasn't a problem. I was just... I mean, it's, we went a real good gallop, and say uh, once we jumped the last down the back, and I started to squeeze him up. Um, it was like a completely different horse. The minute I grabbed the hold of him a little bit, I could just feel him pick up. Um, so tough, and just he just must love racing. Um, mm. Serious class, brilliant. With us here is his very, very happy trainer, David Nicholson. Has he always jumped like this? Well, I mean, when you put the gun to his head, yes. I mean, I'd like to say a very big thank you to Jerry Scott the starter, who, uh, the flagship was awkward at the start, he never has been before, and he gave him every chance, they led him on the outside, fine, but I mean, to be fair, Tony gave him, I keep saying it now, the ride of a lifetime, but you won't see one better than that. D David, I have to ask you, he's come here and won this race twice over two and a half miles, are you now tempted to run him even further, perhaps over three miles next season? Yes, <laughs> in one word. <laughs> I, mean, I think we should we should go for King George and see what happens. I mean, he, has, he, has, he hasn't done bad over two miles, two mile and two and a half. He's won over 550,000, I think, now. It's a, it's a wonderful result for you both. Tony, that surely beats riding on the flat. Brilliant. An, an amazing feeling. Um, the reason he probably didn't want the line up was he probably saw me riding Barton Bank yesterday. And he, said, <laughs> <laughs> he said, who's that lunatic? He's not getting on my back. Well, well done, both of you. Cheers, John. Thank you. Well done, Tony. Thank you. Yes, well done, the Duke, with me, another fairly aristocratic trainer, Nick Gaisley, the trainer of tomorrow's uh, big race contender, Party Politics, the one horse in the race who's won it before, of course. Nick, what sort of shapes the end? Well, he, <clears throat> he's on the box on the way up here now. He says there's not a lot more I can do, but he went down to the water treadmill this morning for five minutes, just loosened him up. He's got his feet taped up on the box on the way up here, and I hope he'll be right home in about uh, a couple of hours' time. You'll be very gratified by the state of the ground. It'll suit him, yes. I think it's genuinely good, maybe good fast ground on the national course, and that would be ideal for him. And don't forget my other horse. He's got an each-way chance on fast ground, too. Baba Deer. Yes. Uh -huh. he, he's, he ran well at Kempton. The ground was much too soft for him at Sandown. Um, he's got last year's winning jockeys, so who knows? But the old horse uh, party politics, I mean, he's 18 hands tall. I mean, I, s I suppose the fences look quite small to him. Well, it, it's always brought the best out in him here. He, he ran a terrific race last year, um, which really, if he hadn't done that, we wouldn't have put this into action again this year. But he, he, he came up with goods last year, and uh, he's in good form, and he, he loves it round here. And if there is such a thing as a national horse these days, I, I suppose he must be it. And you say he's very light and handy on his feet, and so the canal turns no problem to him. No, he's always been a very light action horse from the day he walked in the yard for a big horse, you know. He's, um, and, and as I say, the, the year he won, he, he had a bit of luck in running when Brown Windsor fell and he just uh, skipped round him. So that's all in his favour, yes. He has this tube in his throat, of course. Uh, if it's a very windy day, is that a major problem? I don't know. <laughs> uh, the very cold wind was a problem with it, and I suppose it w would be, but we have it quite high up, if you notice, in his neck. Uh, a, to keep out any muck that, uh, or dirt that's been kicked up by the other runners, 
And I hope to a certain extent that uh, would keep the wind out, but, but perhaps we better hope for a quiet day tomorrow. Nick, I hope you have a great run. Thanks very much. Right, that's Nick Gaisley. He's hoping that he'll be tomorrow's hero, but uh, here's today's hero, the Duke, the trainer of Viking flagship. Uh, he's got plenty of stuff. He's not going to spray it. Uh, somebody is, I think, because Viking flagship course, has given us a real champagne moment. His third winner of the meeting so far. Congratulations and to Tony, Tony McCoy, McCoy, his third success of the Grand National meeting, as he said, perhaps the ride of his life, certainly one you'll never forget. Well, still to come, the Marlmay Chase and the Martel Fox Hunters Chase, they come after the news. This Wednesday, enjoy a Saturday night in Leeds. Saturday night means everything to me. I'd rather take drugs and have sex. And I always do two puddings. I tell Irish jokes, I tell Pakistani jokes, I tell Asian jokes. I'm the most unracist person you'll ever meet. This is mad cow stew. <laughs> <laughs> I'm always getting my skirt pulled up, really. And if a bloke made people. a pass at you, you would run a mile. No, yeah, well, there we are. Not been a bad night. An ordinary Saturday night, or one to remember. Modern Times, Wednesday at 9 on BBC Two. Cheers. A summary of the news now on BBC Two with Triona Holden. Good afternoon. The British beef crisis is dominating the meeting of European Union leaders in Turin. They're there to discuss the future shape of Europe, but John Major is using the occasion to urge his counterparts to lift the ban imposed on beef following the scare over mad cow disease. The leaders get together in an elegantly refurbished former Fiat factory in Turin was to open the next chapter in Europe's history, the revamping of its institutions for the 21st century. But with beef threatening to overtake the agenda, his Italian host met Mr. Major early to agree how the issue might be contained. Britain's Prime Minister underlined why it couldn't be ignored. Beef consumption has not only dropped in the United Kingdom, it has dropped quite dramatically in many other European countries. So we all have a common interest in dealing with this problem of confidence, not of health. I emphasize again this problem of confidence that stretches right across Europe. Britain will get help over BSE but the other leaders will expect some thanks from what they regard as the European Union's One Nation Awkward Squad. Pointedly, they're stressing solidarity, but there's irritation too that once again a Euro summit has got sidetracked onto a British agenda. Labour's transport spokesman, Claire Short, has been unveiling their plans to return British Rail to public ownership, but there's no guarantee of when or if they'll buy back shares in rail track. Claire Short, travelling in an appropriate manner today, has been laying out Labour's definitive reaction to the rail sell-off, promising Labour will extend public ownership over rail track as resources allow. The party is committed to a publicly owned and accountable railway, she said. Labour want to reconstitute British Rail at the centre of the rail network. But the government's privatisation publicity highlights difficult terrain for Labour, who don't want to make specific commitments to spend money buying rail track shares back. Instead, they're promising to give the rail regulator more powers to oversee the network in the public interest. Today, as it was announced that the Bermuda-based transport company Sea Containers will run the East Coast Main Line from London to Scotland, a minister called Labour's plan a dog's dinner. But a Labour source said it wasn't their intention to scupper the sale by frightening off investors. The three British soldiers found guilty of killing a Danish tour guide in Cyprus will be sentenced in just over an hour's time. Lawyers for Alan Ford, Jeff Purnell and Justin Fowler are asking for lenient sentences, claiming the three men were so drunk they weren't fully aware of their actions. They could be jailed for life. That's it. More news at 5 to 4. Good afternoon. The news now from the south. A million pounds worth of carpets has been destroyed in a large fire in Berkshire. More than 50 firefighters attended the blaze at Downs Carpets in Hambridge Lane in Newbury. The building was immediately evacuated. Firefighters used water from nearby Kennet and Avon Canal to put out the flames. No one was injured. Detectives hunting Victor Farrant, who's suspected of the murder of Glenda Hoskins from Portsmouth, have found his car in Belgium. 
Victor Farrant has been pursued by police across Europe since he disappeared at the end of February. The body of Mrs. Hoskins was discovered at a home in Port Solent near Portsmouth. He's also wanted in connection with the attempted murder of Anne Fiddler in Eastleigh last year. An initiative to attract more visitors to British peers has been launched in Brighton by the Secretary of State for National Heritage, Virginia Bottomley. 1996 has been designated the Year of the Peer. That's it. I'll be back in an hour. Good afternoon to you. It's a bright day for many of us. In fact, many places will stay dry, but we saw the showers developing across northeast England to begin with, and now a crop of showers have moved south through Lincolnshire into East Anglia towards the southeast, and there's some heavy ones here with some sleet mixed in them as well. They'll continue moving south during the rest of the afternoon, whereas further west, a good deal of fine bright weather with many places enjoying some sunshine. Tonight, the showers fading away, or at least retreating to the east coast. Most places having a fine, clear, cold night with a fairly general frost. Temperatures typically zero to minus four degrees, I suppose, but around the coast, again, a degree or two above freezing. A similar story for Saturday, really. Lots of sunshine in the south and the west of the country, but again, a few wintry showers just feeding along that eastern coast. That's it from me. Bye-bye for now. Yes, it's fantasy football. Frank Skinner and David Baddiel are back. Managers can only watch and wait and move. Come on, Jigsaw! Kick-off is tonight, 11.15 on BBC Two. Yes! <laughs> Back to Aintree, now on BBC Two, for the latest action at the Grand National Meeting. Here's Julian Wilson. Welcome back to an Aintree buzzing with excitement after Viking flagship's second, second successive win in the Mum Melling Chase. A brilliant performance it was. A livid sky above. Uh, we don't think there's going to be any rain in the next 24 hours. But it's been a week for championship performances, and if you were with us this time yesterday, you'll have seen the great American horse Cigar winning the Dubai World Cup. A stunning performance, and I'm ashamed to say that after the race, I made the unforgivable error of calling him a gelding. He is, in fact, of course, an entire horse by Palak Music. Good luck to him. And now we move on to the big novice chase of the day here. It's the Mum Mild May Novices Chase, and runners and riders for that come from Peter O'Sullivan. Number one is Addington Boy, written by Brown Harding. Two, Avro Anson, Mark Dwyer. Three, Hill of Tallow, Richard Dunwoody. Four, Lyndon's Lotto, Lorcan Wah. Five, Act the Wag, Paul Carberry. Six, Golden Spinner, Mick Fitzgerald. And seven is Jibber the Kibber, written by Warren Master. Then here's how they bet. And Hill of Tullow is favourite, but easy in the market, drifting out sharply there from 7 to 4, out to 9 to 4. Addington Boy, 7 to 2, into 100 to 30. Avro Anson, 4 to 1. Jibber the Kibber easing out, 9 to 2. And Avro Anson now 9 to 2 to join him. Good money for the outsider, Act to the Wag. Well back this morning now, 10 to 1 from 14 to 1. Golden Spinner, 16 from 14. And Lyndon's Lotter, the outsider, at 20 to 1. And here is the 9 to 4 favourite, like the previous winner, representing David Nicholson, Hill of Tallow. Well, he's unbeaten in three steeplechases to date. He was an absentee at Chiltern because of a minor mishap, but he's certainly one of the better jumpers amongst the novices. And he put in some memorable leaps when he beat Be Rude Not To at Chepstow. That was a day when we first uh, got an indication of his talent. Norman? Yes, he was just over from Ireland. This was actually his first run over fences. And it was a brave shout to take him to Chepstow first time. Adrian Maguire wrote him this occasion. And um, just, I think, oh yes, on the outside here is Lyndon's Lotto, of course, who also runs in the race today. Um, but he, he did jump, I think, exceptionally well on this occasion. But since he has just missed one or two fences, but walking around, he looks really well. And he, he's an improving horse. He's, could be good. Well, a chance today to prove himself a, a real champion, champion novice. But this is uh, a good class field. Let's join Richard and Skew as they come out of the pack. Leading them out is Avro Anson, Mark Dwyer on board. A very, very good jockey, one of our senior jockeys. Absolutely still riding as well as ever. After him, Lorcan Wire on Lyndon's Lotto, who just seen ran very well behind Hill of Tullow. From John White's stable, he's got into the red in the national. Then the colours of Lady Harris on Hill of Tullow, Richard Dunwoody. She's already had a win at this meeting yesterday with Zabadi. Following him, Act the Wag, Andrew Turnell's Paul Carberry in the Ogden colours. 
after that the diamonds of Addington Boy from Gordon Richards yard and Brian Harding on board there and then following him we've got Jibber the Kibber Jenny Pittman's runner Warren Marston on board had a really nasty fall at Cheltenham hope that hasn't worried him because he can jump very well indeed so that's Jib the Kibber with a Barnsby nose band on there, the orange thing, just to keep it high up, uh, the bit high in his mouth. It, I always call it an Australian nose band, it's Barnsby nose band. Yeah, it is Australian, but it's Barnsby. Learning something all the time. There's a lovely sheepskin nose band on uh, Mark Dwyer's Avro Anson there. That uh, tends to keep the heads down a little bit. He's a bit of a character, Avro Anson. Dylan's lotto there, very serious lock and wire with his blue goggles down that you've really lightened up the fences Richard and Woody on hello who's Julian said Miss Chelton because he, he knocked him a joint on the way to the races in the box which is uh, rather unfortunate and uh, I thought when you were talking about Jimmy the Kibber Warren Marston looked a bit worried when you said well he could hear you but he's pulled his dark goggles down I was like did you, did you wear goggles a lot I was like the plain goggles I was the uh, dark or the coloured goggles give it such a different uh, conception of the colours around you it's uh, um, maybe the darker you are the braver you ride the less you see yes in fact there were goggles in my day skill we even had electricity <laughs> <laughs> but cantering down hill of tallow lovely horses by Roselier as I say Lady Harris's colours already a winner here and Richard Dunwoody riding as well as ever he's really annoyed with himself for not having won the last race yesterday he's such a pro skew you know he, he really analyzes everything but this horse i just wonder if it's too quick for him around here the ground and this course because i see him more of a galloping horse yeah he's not a big horse is he but uh, i thought richard put a fantastic performance on him at one of the great riding performances when uh, he made a very bad mistake at sandown and he gathered him up together we were t we watched him yesterday on a horse he gives the horses time he doesn't chase them away as soon as they make that mistake but uh, typical David Nicholson with that trace clip he's got the uh, uh, he's, he's not clipped across the top it uh, just keeps them warm uh, across their quarters here well there are plenty of horses in this with a chance you don't go for big prizes and uh, get a walk over Addington boy skew I mean he'd been very successful as a novice this season and then they put him up to handicap company last time and he won very nicely indeed yeah that was good performance winning at Doncaster uh, Mark Dwyer rode him that day we've got Brian Harding on him today Brian uh, in fact claims five pound usually but because of the value of the race today he's not allowed to claim the five pound which is obviously a dis disadvantage but the Brian does ride very well he gets makes the most of the opportunities he gets I think this is the if, if you wanted to pick holes in the form of the others this is the one he's an improving horse he'll have Tullow his form could you, you could qu put question marks over it uh, but a, a novice coming in and winning a competitive handicap like he did at Doncaster is very good form lovely looking horse isn't he typical of Gordon Richards he looks really well strong and fit in himself and uh, didn't go to Cheltenham either and uh, but Skew he has been beaten by Avril Anson once this season and, and I, he did unsealed his rider Tony Dobbin that day I don't think he'd have beaten him but different day different course we keep yes, saying exactly it. The, the, the ground should suit this horse Avro Anson he's uh, a, a very very good horse very good three mile hurdler uh, he won at Doncaster a novice chase last time but uh, uh, Comancho his trainer wasn't pleased with him that day uh, he didn't win as well as he should do or was of his us over hurdles should do so it's just interesting to see whether he really has taken to uh, fences he's by that great stair Ardros and a uh, real strong type of horse but he carries his head very high and that makes him a little bit awkward to ride over fences and that's as I say is why the sheepskin nose band is on him yes and I think Mark Dwyer would have ridden this one right in preference to Addington Boy I mean that's even though he rode Addington Boy last time Jibber the Kibber who uh, Warren Marston will be hoping doesn't repeat that blunder at Cheltenham but he is a good horse but he has broken a blood vessel once this season and that's something you would be slightly worried about but he looks exceptionally well runs in the colours of uh, Jeremy Hitchens yes we saw this horse win at Chepstow in the much softer ground and I remember you pointed out then what a lovely chaser he's uh, going to make it's just it is worrying why he made those mistakes round uh, Cheltenham that day but as you pointed out this is a different race different day and Hill of Tullow 5 to 2, now 11 to 4 down here in the ring, adding to Boy 100 to 30. Avro Anson clipped into 4 to 1, Jibber the Kibber 5, out the Wagwell backs 14 into 10, Golden Spinner 16 to 1, and Linden's Lotto 20 to 1.
and the Ogden colours there, his rider Paul Carver has lost his hat already uh, Act the Wag has been back skew and this would be because of the ground, he loves decent ground underneath him yeah and here's, they're all running into the start straight away the six there, Golden Spinner, and what a, not uh, Mick Fitzgerald having trouble getting him into line but uh, look as if they're going to get a pretty even break, over to you Peter Yes, uh, just Addington boy taking oh. away and uh, Kipper the Kipper taking a turn. Looks like it, that away. And racing to the first of the 19 fences this time, an extended uh, three miles. Golden spin-up. Lands in the lead, just screwed a little bit at that one. It's Golden Spinner. And Avro Anson with a sheepskin noseband disputing it with him. As they come to the first of the ditches, Golden Spinner, Avro Anson, then Act the Wag. Jibber the Kipper, very deliberate at that uh, in rear. They come down to the next. Number three, Golden Spinner from Avro Anson, then Act the Wag. Addington Boy's taken quite a strong hold over on the far side. Linden's Lotto nearest to us, just in behind the Hill of Tullow, and finally Jibber the Kibber. So passing the winning post on this circuit. It's Golden Spin Up from Avro Anson and Act the Wag. And Addington Boy on the inside of Linden's Lotto and almost between horses, Hill of Tullow, and uh, finally Jibber the Kibber. Golden spin up and the uh, under rough quests Grand National rider Mick Fitzgerald from Mark Dwyer, who is without a ride in the national on Avro Anson, then Act the Wag and Addington Boy and Lyndon's Lotto as they jump the fourth hill of Tuller and a little bit de deliberate at that one was uh, Jibber the Kibber in rear. Golden spinner over the fifth from Avro Anson. Back the wag. Lyndon's Lotto and Addington Boy on the inside. Hill of Tallow and then uh, Jibber the Kibber. Second of the ditches. Golden Spinner. And all safely over it. Number seven. The last right over on the far side on this circuit. Oh, and there we lost Lyndon's Lotto. Lyndon Slaughter himself up all right. A reminder there for uh, Hill of Tallow in fifth place. They race towards the next. I've yet to see uh, Lyndon Slaughter look and wire rise, but he's half sitting up. He's got to his feet. He's got to his feet. And act the wag. Right up there now on the outside of Avro Anson with Golden Spinner next. A little gap then to. Addington Boy, then Hill of Tallow and Jibber the Kibber. Coming to the ninth of the 19 fences, and Act the Wag lands in the lead from Abro Anson and Golden Spiller and Addington Boy. And Jibber the Kibber has fallen there. He hasn't been enjoying himself. He'd made one or two mistakes, and he's gone. He doesn't look to have come to any harm. Over the third ditch, Act the Wag from Abro Anson, then Addington Boy. Then Golden Spinner and Hill of Tallow getting reminders again, and uh, he's not looking very happy. And Jibber the Kibber's rider, Warren Marston, who rides Lusty Light tomorrow, he's yet to get to his feet. Back to Wag over the 11th from Avro Anson, travelling very sweetly on his inside under Mark Dwyer. Then Addington Boy, who's done nothing wrong, and then Golden Spinner and Warren Marston up on his feet, all right, and Hill of Tallow is fifth of the five and uh, looking as though he's got plenty to do at the moment to get on serious terms certainly with uh, the three of the four who are heading him Avro Anson on the inside of Act the Wag and then Addington Boy and then Golden Spinner who's possibly not entirely out of it but uh, Hill of Tallow is about uh, 15 lengths adrift of the two leaders who are Act the Wag and Abro Anson as they jump the 12th. Act the Wag and Abro Anson from Addington Boy traveling well on the inside. 
But Addington Boy didn't in fact jump that. He jumped it rather deliberately and just lost a bit of impetus at that one. Coming to the fourth ditch now. Back the wagon, Avro Anson. And then Addington Boy in third, Golden Spinner in four, and Hill of Tallow in five. Five from home. Act the Wagon, Avro Anson from Addington Boy. And a mistake there by Act the Wag. Avro Anson with a sheepskin noseband towards the right as we see them. Being chased now by Addington Boy, who's moved into second ahead of Act the Wag. As they race down towards the next four from home, it's Avro Anson being tracked by Addington Boy. At the fourth from home, Avro Anson, a better jump there. Avro Anson from Addington Boy, who's being chased along now by Brown Harding. And it's Mark Dwyer with a two-length advantage on Avro Anson as they level up for home now with three fences left to jump in the Mum Mile May Novices chase and Addington Boy coming there once again to challenge him at the third last. Addington Boy and a mistake there by Avro Anson and it's Addington Boy the ex-novice winner of six, seven of his 16 races coming up to the final ditch two out. Addington Boy from Avro Anson one fence to jump now act the wagon golden slipper just coming to jump the second last but at the last it's addington boy from avro anson addington boy under brown harding from avro anson trying to challenge again under mark Dwyer. as they come down with the final fence there's not such a big lead now addington boy jumps in from avro anson and it's addington boy from avro anson as they race into the closing stages addington boy being challenged again by avro anson it's going to be close as they come to the line but Addington Boy has just held that challenge of Avro Anson. Addington Boy is the winner. Avro Anson is second. Golden Spinner is third. And it's going to be close for fourth with Hill of Tallow just getting up to be fourth ahead of Act the Wag. And so the one, two, three in the Mum Mile May Novices chase. First number one, Addington Boy, owned by Got Foods Limited, trained by Gordon Richards and ridden by Brown Harding. The 7-2 winner, second, was number two, Avro Anson, owned by Mr. B.P. Skirton, trained by Maurice Camacho, and written by Mark Dwyer, and third, number six, Golden Spinner, owned by Sir Peter Miller, trained by Nicky Henderson, and written by Mick Fitzgerald, with fourth, number three, Hill of Tallow. This is the winner, Addington Boy. Yes, I don't like to uh, knock horses, but I didn't think Avro Anson looked all that genuine here. He... Uh, really run back at uh, the winner Addington boy number one in front blue sleeves red and white diamonds there he uh, is uh, a good ride by Brian Harding and uh, Avro Anson really run run back at him from the last yes I think you're being hard on him skew uh, I think they're all out on the feet now Addington boy got in desperately close to the last Avro Anson put a big leap in there and and I thought that he did run to the line. I know he ran around at Cheltenham that day when he lost the uh, Stayers race there. I see what you mean. He just put his head up a bit. But I feel they've gone such a gallop that they were they'd given it yeah. all by now. Yes, I, I, t and just to clarify myself, the other thing I think is Mark Dwyer has given him a very positive ride. Norman and I were talking throughout the race that over hurdles he was held up much more uh, to to the late to later but over fences you have to be more positive it's you can't hold them up like you can over hurdles in case you uh, meet them but a, a lovely uh, victory for a young jockey in brian harding and uh, deserves uh, all the credit he can and he, he gave him a, a very good positive ride as well and this was the third horse sold by the doncaster sales joe white and scott and banks yesterday you know and this one was that's where he came from so another good win for gordon richards and well done to brian harding uh, it's a very, very good young horse, this. Nice to uh, see Gordon back in the winner's circle after his disappointment to both himself and the owners of one man at uh, Cheltenham. Paddington Boy 7 to 2, Avro Anson 4 to 1, Golden Spinner 16 to 1. Addington Boy by Callanish. Good sire of jumpers out of Ballaro Bar by Bargello. Winner of eight of his 17 races now. Number 61 of the season for Gordon Richards. And possibly a first uh, winner over these Malmö fences for Brown Harding. I can't remember him 
riding a winner over them previously and a very good ride he gave this horse too. Neither of the two principals for the ride tomorrow in the National, neither Brian Harding or Mark Dwyer. But Hill of Tallow, Hill of Tallow's rider, Richard Dunwoody, of course, on superior finish. He ran on well to be fourth after not apparently enjoying himself all that well. Golden Spinner's rider, Mick Fitzgerald, on Rough Quest. Jibber the Kibber's rider, Warren Master. Nice to see him get up all right, because he rides Lusty Light. And uh, Act the Wag ridden, of course, uh, uh, by Paul Carberry, who rides three brownies tomorrow. Meanwhile, here now the starting prices on the Mum Malmö Novices Chase. And Addington Boy is the winner at seven to two. Second, Avro Anson at four to one. And third, Golden Spinner at 16 to one. The total returns win, four pounds 20. Places two pounds 30, two pounds 50. Uh, the dual forecast there, seven pounds. The straight forecast, 15 pounds 74. And the disappointing favorite, Hill of Tallow, started five to two. Yes, a very disappointing favourite indeed, and uh, everyone who backed him knew their fate pretty early on, but the first uh, lot of people who knew their fate were the people who backed Lyndon Lotto, who came to grief uh, well, quite early in the race. Lyndon's there with the maroon colours and grey sleeves. It's this place. Yes, you could just see Lorcan Weirdo is just sitting quiet on him. Goes in, it's in very close to the fence, and just lands very, very steep. Down he goes on his nose and shoots Lorcan out the front door. Gives him absolutely no chance of staying in the saddle. I actually had a bad fall myself from that horse, and who usually jumps soundly. Well, right out of the back, there's Jibber the Kibber, and he's still at the back with Hill of Tallow as they come into the straight for the first time. The uh, leader's jumping well, but Jibber the Kibber comes unstuck. He did. He got in very close again, much the same type of fall, and just straight down. Um, but Jibber the Kibber was definitely jibbing today, I think. He was never happy all the way around. And you can see Hill of Tallow just getting detached a little there. Yeah, and he didn't help his cause with the mistake of the last, uh, the next, which left him last to five. But now we have uh, Paul Carberry <laughs> giving a kick to uh, Act the Wag. Avro Anson right up there, and Golden Spinner's in third place. Uh, the winner just tracking the leader on the inside, the blue sleeves. But uh, uh, Norman Skew was saying he was surprised to see Avro Anson in front when he was a horse who was held up over hurdles. He was. Mark Dwyer used to hold him up to the last minute, really, as we saw in the stairs hurdle one year. But um, over fences, they've been making up his mind and making him go on about his business. And last time in Doncaster, he really didn't look happy. But today, he has, he's ran a much better race. Um, Audington Boy is his second, just getting in very close. Act Wag at this stage is getting very tired behind. But Skew is saying about Brian Harding, give this horse a lovely ride. I really think he, he deserves more credit for it. I thought he'd give him a tremendous ride. He went down the paint all the way and never came off the inner. He actually rode him like one Richard Dunwoody, Tony McCoy would have done. You know, rode him with loads of confidence. And here he was looking second best, wasn't he? He was, he just niggled him along there. It's hard luck actually for Tony Dobbin, who was injured at the moment, who of course missed a ride in one man and now, now ends up missing a good winner here, just like and this is where he grabs the race. Just here, inside, inside Mark Dwyer, just got Averance and very close and just slowed him down a bit. But I thought he did well to battle back at the last fence because obviously he'd be a little bit disappointed now with, the, with Addington Boy going on. But he's, he's, for me, he's kept battling well enough. Well, this is the second last, and he's still three, four lengths down there. Jumps that one well enough. But uh, now Addington Boy, who Gordon Richards has trained with considerable skill and uh, uh, worked him up through a good handicap mark, now comes up into Class A company, just running about a little bit, uh, like uh, he is, happened it's a, yesterday. He is, yes. It's a very, very wide run in here, um, especially when you jump to second last. You could go up either track and just as he comes over to the rail he just begins to run a bit again but for a while he did look like he was at the second horse was going to get back to him i think he fully deserved to win because he does get very close in here see brian just sits quiet he just runs through the top and he lands and he's really stopped when he landed and um he, he picked up and kept going well really i think he was lucky he had the rail sticking his right hand there young brian harding who actually comes from where i live in ireland so i know him quite well Mark Dwyer, strikes again. <laughs> yes, Mark Dwyer, you can see now, just get, got stuck into Avarance and gone to the last, gave him a few smacks, and he ran all the way to the line, but I think because of the mistake of the horse in front, that's the reason he got so close. Well, good success. Uh, 
I don't know who the champion novice chaser is this season, do you? No, it, it's, it, you know, everybody was saying it was Mr Mulligan that was one of the best horses we've seen, but that's a good performance on this horse, but I think Gordon Richards had him right for today. Right, let's join the trainer, G.W. Richards, with Jonathan Powell. Well, Gordon, that was a smashing win by adding to the boy. Yeah, he loves that ground, and I give the boy his chance. I think he's a very good boy. If he'd won today, I wouldn't have given him his chance if I didn't think the kid was a decent boy, but I think he's... He gave the horse a super ride. And the horse won the, won the Great Yorkshire as a novice, so he was coming back to novice company here, and he shows he's still improving. He does like this sort of like fast, quickish ground, you know? Because he's a trier, he always trying to run a bit free. He doesn't really like soft ground, but on real good ground, he could just could be anything. He bounces off this type of ground, you see. Twice, but unusually for you, you don't have an interest this year. And in a sense, you wanted Tartan Tyron. Yeah, I most certainly did. He, he, he's a horse that's super fit. Uh, I've trained him all season. He hasn't had the ground and the rating for something very difficult to enter a horse like that in a race. Hope club where everybody's listening. Very, very difficult to enter a horse like him in a race. They have one or two Doncaster then places, but going back to the horse, he's, he's very, very well, but he does need soft ground. You, you, you were tempted to declare him, weren't you, at the 48-hour 48 stage, but you were told, I understand, that if he, if he was withdrawn after that because you felt the ground was a bit fast, you'd be very heavily fined. That's correct, and that's why we took him out. I think, you know, it, it's a bit of a long thing, the 48-hour. I think when you've paid, and they're short of runners in the Grand National, and he could have been one of their fancied ones, and we've paid up all the way, right up. I think they, they you know... They should change the laws a little bit and, and give a bit more rope and, and just try and help a owner who, holds, who owns a horse like that. If it did come up soft, we'd all look a fool, wouldn't we? Gordon, thank you very much. Well, there you are. You can't win. It's the first year of the 48-hour declaration, and of course it was done in the interests of the punters. But well done to GW anyway. Well, this Aintree Spring Festival, it goes from strength to strength. A few years ago, it was a landmark when 10,000 people came to the first two days. But now there are upwards of 20,000 on the Friday of the Grand National Meeting. And, uh, well, as I say, it's a success story. With it's, of course, Chairman Peter Greenall. Peter, it's really built up over the years, hasn't it? Yes, we've, uh, we've gone a long way from the low spot. Um, we expect over 20,000 people today. We expect over 50,000 tomorrow and really uh, we're breaking all records. And yet the big race field tomorrow, it's the smallest field since 1970, only 28 runners. Are you disappointed by that? Well, I think people are rather fixed on the number of 40 because that's the maximum uh, for the safety limit. But uh, in the 60s and 70s, it was quite common to have under 30 runners. And of course, uh, Jerry Scott, the starter for tomorrow, uh, rode Merriman in 1960 to win a 26 runner national and I don't think he would uh, feel that it was any easier with that few runners. Are you happy with the quality of the race tomorrow? Uh, yes, I think we, we've, um, we've got, uh, I mean, Young Hustler, uh, Rough Quest that was uh, second in the Hennessy and uh, um, second in the Gold Cup. Captain Dibble won the Scottish national and of course party politics won here the Martel Grand National. So uh, I think there is uh, some quality in the field. Peter, Aintree tends to burst at the seams nowadays on Grand National Day. Is there any scope for further accommodation? Yes, well, we've, obviously, with the Queen Mother stand was the last development. Uh, we are going to uh, continue to try and put some more above-the-ground facilities for race goers. The Queen Mother's the one in the middle of those three, is it? Uh, that's right, uh, with the roof. And on the right-hand side um, is the Aintree roof, uh, which is quite limited in the numbers that uh, can view from there, and we are, we are looking to put a new stand in its place. And we're going to show you another view you won't have seen, that's of the Nine Hole Golf Course, <laughs> which is another uh, innovation that they enter. Yes, well, obviously outside the, the racing days that take place, we are trying to give a maximum amenity to the local people, and the uh, Nine Hole Golf Course that we put the other side of the Melling Road uh, is, is beginning to mature and uh, I think uh, is becoming very popular for the local people. Well, Peter, you rode a memorable race to win the Fox Hunters a few years ago on, on Lone Soldier. Have you got a fancy for this year's race? Well, Stephen Brookshaw just lives quite close to me and 
he trains Rolling Ball, and I think the horse has a great chance. He and I were great sparring partners, so I wish him the best of luck. I hope it wins, and I hope tomorrow's a great success. Peter, thank you. Thank you, Jim. Well, it's 40 years now exactly since the most dramatic Grand National of all, the one in which uh, Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mother's Devon Loch, fell just 60 yards from the finishing post. It remains one of the most extraordinary sporting mysteries of all time. Jump number 26. And our Morial's down. Devon Lock avoids a collision and takes the lead. Now it's Devon Lock, Eagle Lodge, ESB, entree, close together. Jockey Dick Francis is pushing Devon Lock ahead inch by inch. Eagle Lodge is beginning to tire, but there's still plenty of power in the Royal Horse. Into the final straight with victory inside for Devon Lock. He's clear away from ESB and Gentle Boyer. Only 40 yards to go. Devon Lock can't lose. But he slipped. He's down. ESB streaks past to win by 10 lengths, with Gentle Moyer second and Royal Tan third. Devon locks on his feet again, but it's too late. The most tragic defeat in Grand National history. Dick Francis walks off the track in tears, a bitterly disappointed man, while Devon Lock is led away. Well, it was right here, just opposite the water jump, that Devon Lock had his extraordinary collapse. Many theories have been put forward, none of them conclusive. What's certain is that Devon Lock was no more than 10 strides from the finish when that happened. Well, the man who's relived that nightmare 100,000 times, I should think, <laughs> Dick Francis. Dick, uh, did you have real nightmares about it at the time? I didn't have nightmares, but I couldn't sleep quite a lot. Uh, and uh, it, it's, I've lived with it ever since. People have said to me, why don't you, you include that in one of your mysteries? <laughs> but, but I don't want to include that. It, it's too much of an unusual happening, really. Dick, it must have been awful for you. I mean, you, you must have wanted this to, to go into, into isolation, and yet you had to go and talk to everybody. Yes, uh, I, I got off the horse because uh, he more or less collapsed with me again. He'd pulled all the muscles in his hindquarters. If one looks at the film again, you, you see him prick his ears just as he's approaching the water jump there. And as he pricks his ears, the noise of, a, of the quarter of a million people here who were all cheering for the Queen Mother, it startled him, for a, frightened him for a split second. And his hindquarters refused to act. And down he went. If uh, if I could have got him to his feet immediately, I was almost in front, and uh, far enough in front of the ESB to have still won the race, but it wasn't to be. Dick, uh, there were other theories. The Brian Marshall had ridden the horse. He said that he felt that he might have had a muscular spasm because he had something similar when Brian rode it. I, I've no, I never felt him do anything like that at all. Uh, and uh, he, he went and the Queen Mother gave him to Noel Merlis afterwards to lead the two-year-olds in their work. Apparently he did this all right until that very cold winter in 1962-63. They decided he was falling about a bit about falling about a bit then, and uh, he, uh, you know, they thought they'd put him out of his misery and put him down. But it, it was a great tragedy. I feared that uh, it was going to do racing a lot of harm. I thought Her Majesty might be so disappointed she'd give up race riding. A race, uh, race owning race horses, but no, she went on. She even had other runners in the Grand National since, but none of what or come as near to winning as that. When when I was walking away from from the episode, I could see everyone running towards me for inquests. I oh gosh, and uh, fortunately an ambulance driver drove by and he lowered his window. He said, "Jump in the back, mate." I've never been more pleased to get in an ambulance in all my life. Dick, it's wonderful to see you, 40 years on. Dick Francis, a great jockey and, of course, a world-famous novelist now. We move on now, back to reality. It's the Martell Fox Hunters Chase, a big field. Peter O'Sullivan names them. 26 of them. Number one is As You Were, written by Mr. Dominic Paravani. Two is Brown Windsor, written by Mr. Ben Pollock. Three, Claire Mann, Andrew Balding. Four, Daringly. Major Oliver Elwood, five, Dark Dawn, Stephen Soares, six, Direct, Tim Edwards, seven, Early Dew, Tim Morse, eight is Furry No, David Pritchard, nine, Hamper, written by Richard Mitchell, ten, Jumbo, Chris Bonner, 
11, Cumbelda Rambler, Robert Crosby, 12, Kerry Orchid from Ireland, Philip Fenton, 13, my nominee, Anthony Griffith, 14, off the brew, Mark Bradburn, 15, on the other hand, Captain Adam Ogden, 16, over the edge, Mr. Simon Sporborg, 17, Professor Longhair, Robert Hicks, 18, Quick Rapport, Captain Dominic Ayler's Hankey, 19, Rolling Ball, Richard Ford, 21, Sir Noddy, Christopher Stockton, 22, Son of a Gypsy, Peter Henley, 23, Southern Minstrel, Claire Metcalf, Miss Claire Metcalf, 24, Cinderbell Lad, Mr. Sean Mulcair, 25, The Bird O'Donnell, Tristan Berry, 26, The Country Trader, Jamie Jukes, and 27 is Owlswater, written by Miss Gillian Russell, and here's how they bet. And no mistaking the best backed horse here, rolling ball five to one into three this morning at the offices, up to three to one from five to two on the course. Kerry Orchid seven to two, Dark Dawn eight to one, Cinderella Lad and the Bird O'Donnell ten to one, then it's twelve to one, Claire Man, Brown Windsor, and on the other hand, Jumbo clipped in from, four, from sixteen to fourteen, then it's sixteen to one, Southern Minstrel, twenty to one, I'll Son call him in R then. Twenty five to one, over the edge, thirty three is direct. Hamper, my nominee, and the country trader, 50 to 1, Sir Noddy, quick rapport, Professor Longhair, off the brew, Cambelda Rambler, and Ullswater. And that's followed by 66, very no and early due, and 100 to 1, daringly, and as you were. So she had just sadly prevented from defending his title through lameness, but Brown Windsor, there he is at the back with the yellow and white stripes, blue sleeves. The old horse that he touched off 12 months ago, well, he's in the field again. He's 14 now, but you wouldn't have guessed his age 12 months ago. Well, what a race he ran that day. He really battled all the way to the line. The winners in the inside showed just with the nose band, but uh, Brownie came to challenge, and uh, as they ran up the run-in, he thrust his old blinkered head in front at the age of 13. Dark Dawn, the other horse in contention, Sheer just uh, under a terrific ride, but just uh, actually he didn't get in front, Brown Windsor, but he really battled. He did, Julian. Brown Windsor, the outside, he did. He just showed all his courage. I think the fast crowd will help him today, but he's got every chance. We're in for a tremendous race, I think, with all these runners. Um, the winner was given a great ride this day, but Brown Windsor, I think, you know, he jumps well. He's got a chance. Well, he runs in the colours of Casper Shankid, the son of Bill Shankid, who's been seriously incapacitated since last October. All Bill's friends will be shouting for Brown Windsor, and Bill, our very, very best wishes to you. And they go 7-2 to two now, rolling ball, from 5-2, to two, joint favourite with Kerry Orchid. Then it's 8-1, to one, Dark Dawn, 10, Cinderella Lad, and the Bird O'Donnell, 12-1, to one, Barbos 5. Yes, a very exciting moment for these amateurs. I saw Jerry Scott, the starter, having a chat to the all these riders beforehand because they're inexperienced and they'll all be on top of the tape. And we've said this yesterday in the two and a half mile race yesterday, the start is so vitally important so they'll all be wanting to go out. There's Richard Hicks just uh, going out there, number 17, or Professor Longhair, number 18, quick rapport. There's a horse I know very well, a horse called Rolling Ball. I won the Sun Alliance Novice Chase on him. He's a real bold, fast jumper. A lot of people are questioning the fact whether he will jump around here. He did it, his schooling in France, and the French horses do have a tendency to get in close to the and fiddle. And I think he has the ability uh, to, to jump around here. Obvious, really. It, it just depends on how he just gets over those first two or three uh, uh, fences. He wants a good break out of the gate because otherwise, if he's got horses around him, he might just take a dive at one. But he likes to be in front, and uh, if he's up there and jumps those first two or three he will take a lot of catch now there in the uh, green and yellow is southern minstrel he's been a top class horse in his time used to be owned by bernard hathaway and uh, he is trained and owned by norman chamberlain and his rider is claire metcalf one of the few ladies riding in this race well just before they went out jonathan powell spoke to her your first visit to entry you just walked around the course what do you think of these fences Yes, they're big. Um, horse has been around before, so hopefully everything will go all right if I can stick on him. <laughs> He's a very sound jumper, though, isn't he? Normally he is, yes. 
You look pretty light. How much sort of dead weight will you carry in the saddle? I've got a, a stone saddle, and I'll have about a stone and a half of lead. It's quite a lot. <laughs> When you won on him at Nottingham, you were, you, were, you were very aggressive. You went and made him win the race. You're clearly up to the task. Do you think he has a good chance of winning today? Hopefully he has a good chance, yes. If he jumps around, he should be in the frame. And of course, the girls won this before. Caroline Beasley on Ellie Ogarty, so uh, she was the pathfinder. Could you be the second? Who knows? With a bit of luck, maybe. Well, let's wish her luck. This race is very unpredictable, but 12... Kerry Orchid, lovely horses. He finished third at Cheltenham. He jumped very, very well indeed. He's owned by Peter Curlin, the extremely well-known equestrian artist. Peter is uh, a very keen ho horseman himself. Trained by Eddie o Edward O'Grady in Ireland, and Philip Fenton is his jockey. Once again, Jonathan spoke to him before the proceedings. Peter, you're a man who's captured the excitement of Liverpool so many times on canvas. What's it like to be having a runner here? Well, it's, cer it's certainly different anyway. Um, it's a bit nerve-wracking, but it's very exciting. I mean, your paintings show the drama of uh, entry and the danger as well. How concerned are you about running a horse? Well, it's, it's obviously it's a concern. You'd hope that they're going to get round all right and that, uh, you know, everything will go, go OK and they'll, you know, get back safely. That's the main thing. And in your time, you, you've actually ridden in bumper races and won bumper races. Were you tempted to ride here? Uh, no, certainly not. No, it was, uh, it's a little bit daunting for me. This Kerry Orchid is a very spring grey. grey. He must be a nice horse to paint. Could you envisage painting him in the winner's enclosure here this afternoon? Um, I've painted him already a few times, but uh, I, I couldn't see it quite round here. No, certainly not. But uh, no, he's a lovely horse and he's a great character. And I ride him at home and, you know, he's, uh, he's a pet, you know. And he's got decent form along the way, too. Indeed, he's fantastic. You know, I mean, he ran really well as a five-year-old at Cheltenham, and then he came back, he had a bit of trouble, but he's come back and he ran really well there this year, you know, so we're delighted with him. I'm quite hopeful. Well, we'll be hopeful if he, get, if he gets over the first few, all right. Good luck to you. Right. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Yes, of course, that wasn't the jockey, it was the owner, Peter Curley. Kerry Orchid, good sort. You'll certainly see him on the way around. It's one that Skew and I are bound to see. Let's hope he stays <laughs> up with us. But Edward O'Grady, the trainer, he's uh, back where he belongs, of course, the top of the tree. OK, well, there's plenty of horses in here with a chance. There in the uh, purple and green is Dark Dawn. The Mount of Stephen Squires, a very, very uh, capable amateur. This is a decent horse in him himself. He's uh, run round at Aintree here three times. He's uh, and finished uh, in the, the frame the last three times. So he's uh, got to be one that's going to finish right up there. Here, yeah, former Johnny Green, all horse trained by Janie Brown. 15, now these are colours we know very well, of course we do. Um, and this is, oh, on the other hand, Gordon Richards trains for Robert Ogden. Adam Ogden, Robert's son, in the uh, plate here. He's been doing all sorts of things, flying aid into Somalia, so going round Aintree will be <laughs> quite a pleasant change for him, won't it? But the horse is a decent horse, a former win winner of the Grand Military Gold Cup. He's 12 to 1 at the moment. And rolling ball back to clear favourite now at 7 to 2, having touched 4 to 1. Kerry Orchid 9 to 2 from 7 to 2. Dark Dawn is 8 to 1. A little money for Claire Mann, 12s into 10s, along with Cinderella Lad and the Bird O'Donnell. 12 to 1 Brown Windsor, and on the other hand, 14 to 1 Jumbo. There's number 25 in the black and orange sleeves. That's Bird O'Donnell, mount of Tristan Barry. He's having his first ride over this, these fences, a young man. I uh, know he's. Uh, had a walk around the course earlier on. I was uh, giving his father a little bit of advice to pass on to him, so <laughs> I don't know if I've been any help or not. Trained by uh, Richard Barber, the leading point-to-point -point trainer down in the uh, West Country there. And uh, anything that Richard produces will be fit and ready to run. And it looks, well, it's got diamonds on its back. Now here is an, another boy, the son of famous person. It's John Edward's son, Tim, riding direct. This horse would want it slightly softer, but they do say it was right. They were just getting their feet in the uh, national course more than on the mile base. So don't rule this one out. He's 33 from 25s, but he's quite useful. Yeah, I had a chat to John before. John said that uh, Tim's a big lad. He was 13 stone at Christmas, so he thinks this will probably be the last time he has a chance to go around in this race. John was a good amateur himself. Number 16 wandering around there is uh, Mr. Simon Sporborg's Spor mount over the edge and uh, it's owned by Christopher Sporborg who does so much for racing. He's the uh, chairman of the 
Professional Riders Insurance Scheme and anybody who gets hurt, he uh, sorts out the money for him. So uh, racing has a great debt to Christopher Sporborg. Yes, the Amateurs Grand National this is. 13 going through there is uh, uh, my nominee, uh, Anthony Griffiths on board this one. Got a bit to find, he was second last time. He's only an eight-year-old though, you know, and uh, he's got a, a bit more to come out of him just yet, but I think his form's not quite good enough, but anything can happen in this race. 33 to one at the moment. The Sid Brillat, number 24, the matter Sean McClare. This was well fancied in the in a race at Nottingham when he fell, Southern Minstrel won the race that day but uh, he wants to pick his feet up a little bit more today but it's difficult to start they're coming into line and uh, there on the inside is rolling ball keen to get a good start number 22 trying to get into line and peter will take you through it simon morant there in the background this is son of a gypsy giving him a little bit of trouble the majority of them in a pretty good line and uh, it's a full start tape broke Tape broke there. Uh, Kerry Orchid didn't go, nor did Over the Edge, and nor did the Country Trader. And uh, the flag still raised by Jerry Scott to indicate the non start and the flags. You'll notice the recall men, very, very active. Picked up uh, Jerry's signal immediately. Uh, the riders were in absolutely uh, no doubt that uh, uh, an on start Simon Morant the senior starter in the background there and you'll see how that uh, tape was broken there and this is a very very difficult thing to avoid these after all they're not uh, police horses these Trained, uh, these horses trained to race, ready to explode, and they're not easy to control under these circumstances at all. Now wait there! Hold. Hold steady. Wait! Wait, sir, Coming in again, and this could be it. It is. They're away. And uh, my, dom my nominee is one of the first to show with the red blinkers towards the left as we see them. Brown Windsor's right up there, and so is Early Dew. And Cider Berlad not far behind the leaders too. And over the edge on the inside, and Early Dew has gone there. Early in there are several fallers. Early Dew has gone, and also the country trader has gone. Direct has gone, and also Furry No has gone, and Claire Mann has gone also. And they're racing down now towards the chair, the remainder, and they're being led by Rolling Ball. Rolling Ball from my nominee and Sir Noddy. Just in behind them, Son of a Gypsy and Over the Edge. And Rolling Ball landed in the lead there from Sir Noddy and my nominee. And just in behind them, Son of a Gypsy, then Over the Edge. Then on, on the near side, Signed of Berlaird. And off the brew was a faller at the chair, over the water. And Rolling Ball, the leader from Sir Noddy on the inside, little between the two, then come my nominee, then Son of a Gypsy and Over the Edge, then Signed a Berlad on the outside of Dark Dawn. They're beginning to race now towards the uh, Melling Road, and as they do so, it's Sir Noddy and Rolling Ball from my nominee, then Son of a Gypsy and Signed a Berlad and Over the Edge, and then comes Brown, Windsor and Hamper, and across the Melling Road, it's Sonotti on the inside of Rolling Ball and over to John Hanmer. And they're well strung out already. Sonotti on the inside, then Rolling Ball there, clear of my nominee, then Son of a Gypsy. And Rolling Ball and Sonotti took it together. The leader's over safely. And they're streaming over, very well strung out indeed as they come now to the six. Rolling Ball has the lead. Rolling Ball from Sonotti in second place. Then in third is my nominee as they come now to the open ditch and rolling ball the leader from Sir Noddy. Then my nominee, Cinderella Lad, son of a gypsy. Then comes Daringly and Brown Windsor. And then on the outside, we've got Hamper as they run down. 
to the next. Rolling ball, the leader, from in second place, the Noddy, and over to Jim McGrath. And rolling ball sailing along in the lead here. A good four or five lengths in front of Sir Noddy. In third placing, then, is Son of a Gypsy, followed further back in the field by Brown Windsor. Cinderella Ladders next now as they come towards the next one, and rolling ball jumps it well from Sir Noddy. And they're about 10 or 12 lengths clear of the field. Son of a Gypsy back there. So Brown Windsor's been brought down. Brown Windsor's gone, and my nominee's gone as well. Coming now towards Beaches, and the leader here is Rolling Ball, a good 10 lengths in front as he comes to Beaches, now he jumps it well, lands in front of Sir Noddy in second, a long gap then to Cinderella and Son of a Gypsy from Jumbo, and further back is Kerry Orchid, half is out very wide, followed by Daringly, and behind them is over the edge, further back in the field then is the Bird O'Connell, as they head now towards the Point Avon fence, the leaders have jumped it well, uh, well back in the field is Quick Rapport, uh, oh, well back in the field too is Southern Minstrel, a mile behind from Cambelda Rambler, but it's a rolling ball in front of the canal turn. He's still 10 lengths in front. He got it okay, though. Jumped it well. From in second placing, Sir Noddy. A long gap to Cinderella Ladder jumps at third. Further back in fourth, then Son of a Gypsy from Jumbo. As the leader now goes over Valentine's rolling ball, and he's six lengths in front of Sir Noddy giving chase. Then Cinderella Lad as we rejoin John Hanmar. And they've got five to jump. Rolling ball by five lengths from Sir Noddy. Eight lengths then to Cinderella Lad in third place. And a big gap after that to Son of a Gypsy and Kerry Orchid. And then comes Jumbo, Hamper, Quick Rapport and my Bird O'Donnell as they come to the last ditch, four out, and there Sir Noddy takes over from Rolling Ball. Cinderella Lad is third, then Son of a Gypsy, Kerry Orchid, Jumbo, then the Bird O'Donnell and Hamper who made a mistake, and then comes Daringly, Quick Rapport and over the edge. And meanwhile, over the third last, Sir Noddy, the leader by two lengths from Rolling Ball, 12 lengths then to Cinderella Lad in third place, and a big gap after them to Kerry Orchid, Son of a Gypsy, Jumbo, the Bird O'Donnell, Daringly, Hamper, Quick Rapport over the edge on the other hand, and then well back, Southern Minstrel, but as they go towards the second last, it's Sir Noddy challenged by Rolling Ball and Cinderella Lad and Kerry Orchid, and over to Peter O'Sullivan. Yeah, still Sonardi from Rolling Ball, then a gap to Cinderbro Lad, and then Kerry Orchid the Grey making ground all the time. But it's Sonardi. Sonardi and Rolling Ball have disputed this from the very start, and Rolling Ball is coming back into contention over on the far side. Sonardi on the near side, Rolling Ball on the far side. Cinderbro Lad is not done with, and Kerry Orchid is back in for Sonardi landed in the lead there. Cinderbro Lad is making relentless progress towards the left of the picture as they race down towards the final fence in the Martell Fox Hunters chase. It's a three-horse race up front, and they land almost in unison. Rolling Ball is beginning to pick up again on the far side. On the near side, it's Cinderbro Lad, but it's Rolling Ball who is sprinting now as they come down towards the elbow. Rolling Ball it is. The leader by two to three lengths from Cinderbro Lad, and then comes Sonotti and Kenny Orchid finishing like a train. It's Rolling Ball now with Kenny Orchid putting in a tremendous run over on the far side. Rolling Ball on the near side, Kenny Orchid on the far side. It's going to be close. Rolling Ball and Kenny Orchid. Rolling Ball has just won it from Kenny Orchid with Sonotti third. Four came Cinderbro Lad and five the Bird O'Donnell, then Son of a Gypsy and then Hamper. Behind Hamper was Southern Minstrel and behind Southern Minstrel was Daringly, behind Daringly was Jumbo and then over the edge, behind over the edge was on the other hand and then came Professor Longhair and Rapport and finally Ulswater. Those are the finishers and this is the winner. Number 19, Rolling Ball, owned by Mrs. Helen Clark, Mrs. Stan Clark, trained by Stephen Brookshaw, Trosbury, a 13-year-old, one of the three oldest horses in the race, and ridden by Mr. Richard Ford. Here he comes on the near side, being challenged by the grey Kerry Orchid for Ireland and for Peter Curling, who made a tremendous run from the second last fence but just couldn't quite get there he's second carry orchid with third number 21 sonodi who was up there all the time and fourth number 24 cinderbro lad that's the one two three four in this 1996 martel fox hunters chase the amateurs grand national with the 26 runners 
who went to post winners of 122 races between them a real championship for the amateurs the distance is one and a half lengths and six lengths and at last a favorite has obliged in fact only the second in 11 races at this great grand national meeting so far rolling ball French bread by Cardevin out of Etoile du Berger the third. Becomes the outstanding hunter chaser of the year. Winner of the Sun Alliance at Cheltenham in his younger days. And Richard Ford certainly gave him a marvelous ride. Just gave him a breather. Approaching the second last. Stan Clark, the chairman of Utoxida and at Newcastle, proudly leading in this winner to tremendous applause from the crowd here. This is the greatest moment in an amateur rider's life to win the Martell Fox Hunters at Liverpool. I don't know about my colleagues, uh, but I didn't see him make a semblance of a mistake, this horse. Tremendous performance. And with, as I say, finally, a favorite successful and rolling ball winner of the seventh of his 18 races, the starting price is as follows. Only two successful favorites at this meeting, both in hunter chases. Here, rolling ball, the winner, seven to two. Second number 12, Kerry Orchid at five to one. Third number 21, Sir Noddy at 50 to one. So, rolling ball, the favourite, wins a dramatic fox, fox hunter's chase. He led for most of the two and three quarter miles. Five fallers at the first fence. We'll be back with a review of this race shortly. That's after the news at 3.55. Now on BBC Two, more from the newsroom and Triona Holden. Good afternoon. We've just heard that lawyers acting for the Home Secretary, Michael Howard, have reached a settlement with the former head of the prison service, Derek Lewis. At a private High Court hearing, solicitors agreed to pay Mr Lewis a year's salary of £125,000. But he said afterwards he would still be fighting for his bonus and pension contributions to be paid. Our Home Affairs correspondent, Jane Peel, has joined me now in the studio. Jane, can you explain to us the background to this? Well, Derek Lewis was rather unceremoniously sacked in October, just hours before the publication of a damning report into two prison escapes from Whitemoor and Parkhurst jails. It caused a furious row at the time about whether it should be Mr Lewis as head of the prison service or the Home Secretary Michael Howard who should take the blame for what went wrong. Mr Lewis was sacked but always claimed that he had met all his targets and that he was wrongfully dismissed. He immediately launched a, a writ and ever since then there have been negotiations going on privately and in court to try to settle this and it would appear that in this private hearing today it has now been settled. Thank you, Jen. The British beef crisis has been dominating the summit of European Union leaders in Turin. They're there to discuss the future shape of Europe, but John Major has been pressing them to lift the ban imposed on beef following the scare over mad cow disease. The leaders get together in an elegantly refurbished former Fiat factory in Turin was to open the next chapter in Europe's history, the revamping of its institutions for the 21st century. But with beef threatening to overtake the agenda, his Italian host met Mr Major early to agree how the issue might be contained. Britain's Prime Minister underlined why it couldn't be ignored. Beef consumption has not only dropped in the United Kingdom, it has dropped quite dramatically in many other European countries. 
so we all have a common interest in dealing with this problem of confidence, not of health, I emphasise again, this problem of confidence that stretches right across Europe. Britain will get help over BSE, but the other leaders will expect some thanks from what they regard as the European Union's One Nation Awkward Squad. Pointedly, they're stressing solidarity, but there's irritation too that once again a Euro summit has got sidetracked onto a British agenda. Labour's transport spokesman Claire Short has been unveiling the party's plans to return British Rail to public ownership, but there's no guarantee of when or if they'll buy back shares in rail track. Claire Short said Labour would extend public ownership of the railways as resources allowed, and she promised to give the rail regulator more powers to oversee the network. The three British soldiers found guilty of killing a Danish tour guide in Cyprus are about to be sentenced. Lawyers for Alan Ford, Jeff Purnell and Justin Fowler are asking for lenient sentences, claiming the three men were so drunk they weren't fully aware of their actions. They could be jailed for life. That's it. The next news is the 6 o'clock news on BBC One. Good afternoon. The latest now from the south. Members of the Rail Maritime Transport Workers Union, who are employed by the cross-Solent ferry operator Whitelink, have announced a 24-hour strike scheduled to start at 5 a.m. on April the 9th. The date set for the strike misses the Easter weekend. The union says it's willing to continue negotiations right up to the day of the proposed strike. A million pounds worth of carpets has been destroyed in a large fire in Berkshire. More than 50 firefighters attended the blaze at Downs Carpets in Hambridge Lane in Newbury. The building was immediately evacuated. Firefighters used water from the nearby Kennerton Avon Canal to put out the flames. No one was injured. An initiative to attract more visitors to British peers has been launched in Brighton by the Secretary of State for National Heritage, Virginia Bottomley. 1996 is the year of the peer, and a number of events will be staged in the coming months. That's it for the moment. We'll have more news at 6.30. Good afternoon to you. Well, many parts of England and Wales at least are in for their dullest march of the century. There's been some sunshine around today, notably in the western half of the country, with most of the showers again down the east. There are some heavy ones too, with some sleet mixed in them. The heavier ones coming down through Lincolnshire, into the East Midlands and East Anglia during the early part of the afternoon. And they're now getting into North London as well. Some fairly wet conditions to come for the next few hours. Now through this evening and overnight we'll find the showers becoming more confined to that eastern coastal strip and across the northern isles. That'll lead to a clear cold frosty night down to minus three, minus four perhaps in some sheltered parts of the north. But again on Saturday a lot of sunshine around mainly on the western side of Britain. Still those wintry showers hugging that eastern coast but I think there won't be as many around as there have been today. That's it from me. A weekend of sport starts tomorrow with coverage of the ultimate test of strength and stamina, the Grand National. <laughs> FA Cup semi-final action between Chelsea and Manchester United, live from Villa Park. And coverage of the Brazilian Grand Prix, live from the Interlagos circuit. For all armchair supporters, a weekend of sport only from BBC Television and BBC Radio 5 Live. In 45 minutes, Martin Lewis with Today's the Day. That's after BBC Two's last visit of the day to the racing at Aintree with Julian Wilson. Welcome back to Aintree where we saw a fast and furious race for the Fox Hunters chase. And here once again is a check on the result. The winner, the favourite, Rolling Ball, number 19 at 7 to 2. Second, number 12, the Irish challenger, Kerry Orchid at 5 to 1. And third, number 21, Sir Noddy at 50 to 1. 15 out of the 26 finished and the only injury news we have is uh, that Tim Edwards who rode the direct. Tim Edwards, the son of uh, John Edwards, uh, he suffered rib injuries. He was one of five, remember, that fell at the first fence. Well, fast and furious as I say and uh, to pick up the threads of the race we have uh, Peter, Richard and Norman Williamson. Take it away boys. Well, yes. the thing here is they went absolute crazy pace down to the first. They did, yes, and uh, they paid the penalty. If apart from these five falling around here, everybody's got round uh, safe and sound. It was just a little bit of inexperience and all bunched up together. And uh, the first there, they, there they go. Just in the middle of their skew. Brings down Tim Edwards there, you can see in the yellow cap. 
He's just been kicked everywhere at the moment. I spoke to him er earlier. He was hoping he'd have a good ride, but his, his fate was sealed pretty early. Gary yes. Orchard was very, very lucky to sta stay up there, so he may have been a, an unlucky loser, the horse in the blinkers, the grey horse in the blinkers at the back. Let's ident them. It was Clare Man, Direct, Early Jew, Furry No, and the Country Trader, the five who went at the very first fence. Uh, the race is beginning to sort itself out and already rolling ball has gone to the front and what we were sorting ourselves out we were saying will he go and fiddle and he really does here it's a really superb yes, Hugh, i must say you've done a tremendous job schooling him as a novice <laughs> so you, you must be brilliant he was waiting he for really the jaw break here well. yes, he, was. <laughs> he was very very good he shortened up and you know he was running so free you'd think he'd just step into these fences but he really did he backed off the chair well all streaming over there well not all but one because on the inside now there's mark bradman going out off off the brew um and there he's yet again, well in front of his horse yet again richard carry over and i don't know he must love horses because he's jumping all <laughs> these loose horses um very lucky down the inside to get away with that again but after that of course it was plain sailing for a very long way as they come down to the one before beaches and see the leader here he's drifted out hugh you uh, excuse you said he hangs one way and jumps the he other he does yes uh, he uh He's, he is a very difficult ride, and when we see him canal turn, he's difficult to get around. I thought uh, the jockey Robert Ford gave him a really great ride. Um, he never panicked on him because he never just he's streaming easy. over there. They go. Brown winds are just being brought down there with the blue cap. Gets a pretty nasty fall, but he gets up okay, and off he goes again. Yes, my nominee was the horse that fell and brought him down. But uh, up front, and this horse I going can... right across Richard Ford, taking a look over his shoulder. Yes, he's uh, come wide. There is still a little bit of a drop to uh, Beaches, being very, very sensible. But uh, he got very, very close there, Skew. I thought he was very clever to get out, and he, you know, he didn't even peck and landing. The so Noddy is the horse well. that's uh, chasing him up. Yes, we were laughing through the race when you're riding a horse like Rolling Ball, who is very quick. The last thing you want is uh, somebody upside you chasing you along. And uh, Sir Noddy and uh, Christopher Stockton is <laughs> keeps on at uh, Rolling Ball, and in fact takes the lead off him later on. They're just coming down, getting ready for Canal Turn, as you say, the smallest fence now. This is uh, trappy in its own way. Sidra Lad coming over in the white colour. There's Kerry Orchard going, uh, going along. He's got uh, a lot of ground to make up from there. Well, he's got no chance. You know, it's his chance has been ruined at the first. Yep. It has really. You, you can see here, rolling ball in front, how free he's running. He's absolutely running away. And again, he jumps way out and goes a long way wide. But I think he's just hanging right more than anything. Skew. Yeah, as I say, he is. You can see him fighting the uh, commands to come left. He's a very difficult horse. He opens his mouth on you, and it hasn't helped him here because we always point out how important Canal Turn is, and it's allowed the others to come back at him. It's allowed Sonodi to, to uh, come at him again. And when a horse like this, you like to be a left alone in front and Sonodi's uh, I think so, so you can just see Kerry Orchard coming into the picture he's still a long way back but he had a good turn at the canal turn and he's just beginning to creep into it Cinder Brillard's gone into third and the white face there with the red colours that of course is Jumbo in the Pell-Mell uh, colours he's just behind him with the Bordeaux Donald um, actually run him, run him over hurdles one day I'm, I'm surprised to see him getting around after me right in fact he's <laughs> been given a good ride by Tristan Barry here you know it's his first uh, yes, visit a great thrill for him I thought here now that uh, they, they they started to race too early Christo uh, uh, Christopher Stockton really coming up sides uh, yes I think it was this fence now skew he just got it yes it was he got a great jump and actually went by rolling ball here in the air I think yeah. rolling ball now, you definitely wouldn't want to be on him here because you think he'd be very free but I think a great ride from Richard Ford, he just took his time and switched, yeah. he switches now later on. And that son of a gypsy, isn't it, back in uh, in fourth place there, Peter Hedley. And then the yellow colours of Quick Rapport and Dominic Alice Hankey. So quite a few of them still in, you know, having a bit of a jaw. These fences are lovely to jump. Once uh, you're up and you get over those first few, these are the, the, I think find them, I'd rather go around here than a lot of tracks. Yes, you've, al you've always got light and you've always got a lot of room. And um, like you said, it's the first, se first, second, third fence. Once you're over them, you really can, and you can go where you want. Um, it's just R Richard Ford is just giving rolling ball. It seems to be a bit of a breeder there. He's just sitting and letting him alone. Do, do you think he's pleased with that now? Do you think that he thinks this is ideal? I can take a breather. Yes, I don't. I, I'm, I'm not. Sh you know, you're, you're not thinking that type of thing. You're just hoping from that sort of thing. Your horse picks up again. Some horses can be disappointed when you take it on. I just, you know, I keep. I mean, Sonodi, uh, Christopher Stockton's given a, a great ride, but I could hear the sound effects when. Uh, 
earlier when Peter was commentating, you could hear Christopher really growling and, and, and going for the horse. Here I thought these horses might be a little bit tired. Sidra Lad now in the white and the blue and Kerry Orchid queuing up to do do them. Come to this awkward second last and uh, as you say, yes, Richard Ford. Yes, they all know how awkward this has proved. It, you know, getting the first, first fence today, a lot of foreigners at it. It has been proving an awkward fence and I'm sure they'll be getting quite worried going to it. Horses just beginning to get tired and I think once you're over this, you're pretty safe. You, you're pretty certain you'll get over the last if you jump this. Kerry Orchid's still a long way off the lead and as far as I know, he misses this quite badly. But he is making ground, and it's a long way home from here. Yes, and again, you see Richard Ford is beautifully not panicking. He's, he's eased the horse back now, but he's got the gas out of him. And uh, he's clever there, the horse, and he really, really uses himself at this streaming over. Kerry Orchid, as you said, made a bad mistake. Just behind him. Big white jumbo pace of Jumbo on the inside, on the inside yes. And all streaming over. And as they come down to the last now, he's still sat on... Uh, Yes, it's just, ball. as you said, Skew hangs right. Well, I think it just helped him, the horses on his outside. Um, once he went on, and we'll see up the running, that he, he went a long way right, but but still here. I think his class comes into play, the way he just points his toe and things up a bit. Harry Orchid, the grey horse there, he's beginning to, he keeps to the straight line. Rolling Philip ball. Fenton give him a real strong ride. He probably would have done with softer ground on the day, I should think, but he really can't take anything away from the window, the way he's pointing his toe, he loves that ground. But isn't it amazing that here he is, coming to the elbow, in front, and yet he finishes up right underneath the grandstands. As I said, when I won the Sun Alliance with, uh, with him, he, he did exactly the same, really started to roll around. I didn't look as stylish as Richard Ford on him, though. He's, he's pulled his stick through, he's done everything right. <laughs> he's given him a crack, and the horse is still... He doesn't run for uh, the stick, this horse, and uh, he's still coming across. Kerry Orchid keeping to the inside there. It's eating up the ground all the time, but when he gets to the rail, he can then pull his stick back the other way, and he can... Uh, he, there he is, he's got his stick through, and he's, now he's able to give him a slap again, and the horse is run on again now, once he's got to that rail, and and straight a very very well ridden but what a game performance from the second too i mean that line there gives you the the decision it's a length and perhaps a length and a half almost in and the as end. you said when we've seen the, the trouble that the poor horse has gone through and the the rider has gone through he has he was a long way and the, even after the canal turned the second horse he was off the rider from then on and um he did well to get where he did but I, I don't think on the day he should probably beat the winner the winner if he didn't drift across the track yeah. skew don't you think he'd have won well he he stands out as a class horse having done what he's he's, he's done in the past and don't forget the other finishers uh, plenty of finishers there but uh, Richard Ford who is a very good jockey rides Monica Dickinson's point to pointer so he'll be well schooled for this <laughs> there is the winner in Hilda Clark's colors well done Richard Ford memories of hello dandy that and there is Richard receiving the Fox and Hunters case trophy from, from Patrick Martel the moment uh, he'll never forget and uh, a terrific ride that he gave this horse, gave him a little breather, three quarters of a mile out, and then had the resources to come back and win. Peter Greenall presents the Fox Hunters Silver Cup trophy. The colours of Mr. Stan Clark, the owner of Newcastle and New Toxter race courses, and uh, Jonathan Powell's been speaking to him. Stan, it must be so exciting to own a horse to win the Fox Hunters in that manner. Exciting. I was excited before it started because I thought the ground was good for him. He won the Sun Alliance on this ground. And when he were at Warwick about three weeks ago, I thought if he run, runs like that, it'll take some stopping. I'm thrilled to bits. But to go off in front and jump from fence to fence, that was something else. Tremendous. And wasn't the jockey smart? Gave him a breather around the back when they came at him. And uh, no, he did a very good job. And the horse is very well. This horse disappeared from England a couple of years ago. You sent him to France. He lost his form. Had you given up hope with him after that? Well, uh, they, they, a great friend of mine and a tremendous trainer said you should retire him but Steve Brooks was a great man for refreshing horses up he's been hunting had a great time hunting and he's got him very well he's big as a bull yeah so uh, no I never gave up hope for him he's a class horse and you're a man who runs race courses at Newcastle you Toxeter is there a better race in the world than the Grand National and over these fences? Not at all. I mean, I think I came in today and I want to congratulate all the management here. I thought the place was immaculate and, spe and, and spotless. And I think the, the feeling here of excitement even today has been tremendous. Congratulations to them all in racing. Well done today. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Good for Stan Clark and confirmation that the only injury we've heard of so far is to Tim Edwards, the young rider of direct who damaged his ribs in that fall at the first fence. We now move on to our fourth race of the second day of the meeting. It's the long distance novices hurdle, the Belle Epoque Sefton novices hurdle, three miles and 110 yards. Peter O'Sullivan names one as a rider. Number one is arithmetic. 
Uh, written now by Lorcan Warren instead of uh, Warren Marston. Warren just a bit shaken up, but it'd be okay to ride tomorrow. Rides Lusty Light in the big one. Two Blaze Away, written by Graham Bradley. Three Buckhouse Boy, Tom Jenks, rides Captain Dibble tomorrow. Four Buttercup Joe, written by Tony McCoy. Deep Bramble, of course, tomorrow. Five Claver House, written by Mark Dwyer. Six is Father Sky, written by Jimmy McCarthy. Seven is Lord of the West, written by Alan Roach. Eight. Lottery Ticket, written by Mick Fitzgerald, a rough quest tomorrow. Nine, Mr. Kermit, written by Luke Harvey. Ten, Far and Near, Richard Dunwoody, uh, su uh, superior finish tomorrow. Eleven is Pleasure Shared, written by Paul Carberry. Three brownies tomorrow. Twelve is Superior Risk, written by David Bridgewater. Encore and Purr tomorrow. Turnpole, written by Peter Niven. Fifteen is Wisley Wonder, written by Carl Llewellyn, rides uh, his old friend Party Politics tomorrow. Sixteen, Yami, written by Guy Upton, who rides Plastic Space Age tomorrow. And seventeen is Flo, written by Brendan Powell. That's Flo just going out of the gate, and uh, here's how they bet. And we have co-favorites, sorry, joint favorites here. Turnpole and Foreign Air, four to one from seven to two. Superior Risk drifting out to six to one. Father Slide, Wisley Wonder, Blaze Away, all 10 to 1. Arithmetic is 12 to 1, together with Buttercup Joe. 14 to 1, Buckhouse Boy, and Pleasure Shared. That's followed by 20 to 1, Lottery Ticket. 25's Mr. Kermit in Yami. 50 to 1, Clover House and Lord of the West. And 66 to 1, Flo. And the good news that all the horses, including, of course, those who tipped up at the first, survived without injury after that... Uh, eventful fox hunters and no serious injuries to riders either yes good race this the fellow fox sefton novices hurdle three miles and half a furlong the favorite uh, turnpole trained by mary reevely who is perfectly adept at getting winners on any coast there he is in behind that group there Peter Niven just quietly taking this going around on his own. Lovely horse, one all three, goes up in distance today. But I don't think that will at all worry this horse. He's four to one joint favorite from seven to two. Mary Reevely in form at the moment. I think this horse is a worthy favorite. There are there at number 10, the Mount of Richard and Woody is far and near. This horse is a decent novice. You want to, it's very impressive when you want a handicap hurdle at Warwick, which is always a good performance for a novice stepping up at the handicap company. He's a four to one joint favorite from seven to two. It's a different ground that he's uh, handicap uh, handled properly before. He pulled up on the good foot to firm at uh, Sandown and uh, he was dismounted the jockey reported he was concerned about the horse's action and the running and that was good to firm so there must be a little bit of a doubt about him handling the ground yep. and uh, there in the darren mercer colors were terrible cheltenham he had but uh, he's already had a good run from escart feig today superior risk horse that's one point point and one over fences back over hurdles now martin pipes already had two winners at the meeting he'd be delighted with that in bridgie uh, on superior risk here as a major chance this horse and uh, a horse you know just because they've been chasing doesn't mean that their speed is blunted at all i like this horse a lot it's quite a good race this yes martin told me he really fancies this was to, to run very well he says he prefers softer ground but he thinks he's a very highly talented horse number one is arithmetic Mark Pittman uh, pointed at this horse out to me at Newbury, said he's a very, very good horse and he's duly obliged to uh, to go and win. He's by Taurus. Uh, he's owned by Robert and Elizabeth Hitchens, who've had uh, so many uh, good horses in training with uh, Jenny Pittman. And as you know, Warren Marston uh, giving up his mounts now and Lorcan Wire taking over. Yeah, and in the... Uh Half colours there, number six is Father Sky from Simon Oliver Sherwood's yard, rather than up in Lambourne. And uh, Jimmy McCarthy on board, we've already seen him give a good ride to Colton today. Ten to one from nines. Now, this horse, you know, was brought from Ireland to be a good horse last season, didn't quite click. They had a little operation on him, and he was much better rattling off three wins in a row early on. Again, a horse that you cannot dismiss, although he has drifted a point in the betting. Is there Perhaps the most famous colours of all in the race, the uh, famous Paul Mellon's black golden cross, black and gold cross. This horse uh, had a run on the flat at Doncaster. He's uh, 
two mile two he was third at Doncaster earlier this week um, his hurdle race form perhaps isn't so good but uh, he, he just picks his feet up a little bit he should stay well and as usual with uh, Ian Boulding's horses they'll be beautifully schooled and it doesn't he turn out he's turned him out absolutely immaculately again and now we have a clear favourite here, Turnpole at 4 to 1, Baronier drifting out to 92, Superior Risk 6, plays away 9, 10 to 1 Barbos. Well, it's not going to be, uh, they're not going to hang around once again, but uh, uh, the action will soon be underway. Three sorry, miles ago, two circuits. Let's join Peter O'Sullivan. And that's it, they're away to our first time up with Flo on the far side. Wisley Wonder, right up with them, Superior Risk, with the white face, and then near the stands, Buckhouse Boy, Superior Risk. Landed in the lead there, they're all safely over the first, from Wisley Wonder and Flo, and my goodness, they're really hacking on now. Coming up past the winning post, they've got 13 flights in all, or another 12. Wisley Wonder, and Superior Risk disputing it, just ahead of Flo on the inside, then Buckhouse Boy and Buttercup Joe. And then on the inside, Father Sky. So they race over to the far side with Lord of the West not far behind the lead. And Superior Risk goes to the front again from uh, Wisley Wonder and Flo and Buckhouse Boy and Buttercup Joe and Lord of the West. And behind them, Father Sky on the inside. And then comes Arithmetic, behind Arithmetic is Lottery Ticket. Superior Risk over the second, really tanking on from uh, Wisley Wonder. Then Buckhouse Boy and Flo and Lord of the West and Buttercup Joe and Arithmetic on the inside. And then comes Far and Near. Blazeaway is one of the back markers over the next. Superior Risk from Wisley Wonder. As they come to the last over on the far side, uh, the fourth, Superior Risk, the leader from Wisley Wonder, then Buckhouse Boy, and on the inside, Father Sky, just in behind Father Sky, Buttercup Joe, then Far and Near, and also Lottery Ticket towards the outside. Racing on this first circuit towards the home turn, Superior Risk the leader by about three from Wisley Wonder, Buckhouse Boy, behind them Father Sky on the outside of Father Sky's lottery ticket. And then come Buttercup Joe and Lord of the West and Far and Near, behind Far and Near is Arithmetic. And the back marker now is Flo. Superior Risk. By a good couple of lengths to three lengths from Wisley Wonder and Buckhouse Boy and Father Sky. A lottery ticket on the outside. It's being tracked by Far and Near. Buttercup Joe and then Yami. Arithmetic saving ground, sticking to the inside all the time as coming to the sixth. Superior Risk lands in the lead from Wisley Wonder and Buckhouse Boy. Buttercup Joe. Blazeaway is making good progress from the rear. The sheepskin nose band towards the left of the picture as we see them, but as they jump the seventh, it's superior risk. From Wisley Wonder and Buckhouse Boy and Buttercup Joe. Then comes Father Sky, arithmetic over on the far rail, far and near. And then lottery ticket and blaze away. And flow some way behind the remainder, but superior risk. And David Bridgewater who rides encore en peur for the stable tomorrow in the national with the advantage still by about three lengths from Wisley Wonder and Buckhouse Boy Buttercup Joe on the outside of Father Sky far and near next then comes Yami arithmetic on the inside and blaze away is next and behind blaze away is pleasure shared right over on the far side and still superior risk whose rider incidentally is on the 99 mark for the season David Bridgewater over the eighth. Wasn't too clever at that. Had a look at it, but got away with it. Buckhouse Boy has gone second. Buttercup Joe and Wisley Wonder next. Then Far and Near and Father, Father Sky. And then Yami is making quite good progress. Arithmetic on the inside. And also prominent is Pleasure Share. That was the ninth of the 13 flights in all. And still, superior risk making it. 
from Buckhouse Boy in second, then comes Wisley Wonder to the right, Buttercup Joe towards the left, Far and Near next, and then Yami, that was four out, and they flattened it. Superior risk, and David Bridgewater looks over his right shoulder, sees Buckhouse Boy and Tom Jenks, his nearest pursuer. Then comes Buttercup Joe, behind Buttercup Joe, Yami is still making progress, he's been making progress for quite a while now. Racing towards the home turn in this belly box, Sefton Novice's hurdle, and Superior Risk with his white face still showing well clear of Buckhouse Boy as they race round the home turn with three flights left to jump. Coming there quite strongly is Pleasure Shared, who's moved into third place. Then comes Buttercup Joe and Yami coming down towards the third last and it's Superior Risk being chased now by Pleasure Shared. Over the third last, Superior Risk from Pleasure Shared in second, Buckhouse Boy third in fourth is Buttercup Joe at the second last, Superior Risk and Pleasure Shared jumping together and Pleasure Shared is going on now and it's Pleasure Shared under Paul Carberry, Paul looking for his second winner of the meeting, looks as though he's only going to jump the last, it's Pleasure Shared at the last by two lengths from Superior Risk and as they race into the closing stages on the level, it's Pleasure Shared under Paul Carberry going away from the long time leader Superior Risk, and at the line, Pleasure Shared is the winner. Superior Risk is second, and third is Buckhouse Boy, with just getting up to be fourth, Mr. Kermit, ahead of Buttercup Joe. And so, the result of the Belle Epoque Sefton Novices Hurdle. First, number 11, Pleasure Shared, owned by Mr. Tony Eaves, trained by Philip Hobbs, and written by Paul Carberry, his second winner of the meeting, Second was number 12, Superior Risk, owned by Mr. Darren Mercer, trained by Martin Pipe and written by David Bridgewater. Third was number 3, Buckhouse Boy, owned by the Bawtree Boys, trained by Nigel Twiston Davis, written by Tom Jenks, with fourth, number 9, Mr. Kermit. It had been a very quick gallop set by Superior Risk, who looked as if he was going to actually stay there, Skew. But then, once uh, Pleasure Shared came from the pack, it, it changed dramatically. Yeah, I agree. Turning into the straight, I thought uh, David Bridgewell got it sewn up. But he probably would want uh, softer ground Superior Risk. But once again, a brilliant riding performance by Paul Carey. Lovely to see he put the horse right there and then didn't move on him and st not sat up on him, not running him into the bottom of the hurdle, but allowing him to pop. I've said for a long time i'm a great fan of this boy's riding he's a very very good rider we saw him to great effect yesterday over the entry fences he's got the flat race style rides very short but i think that's a, a good thing now over the the type of uh, obstacles we're we're getting but uh, uh, buckhouse boy i thought tom jenks who doesn't get the, a lot of opportunities himself has given him a great ride and uh, I think we could see some lovely chases coming out of that race. Yes, the winner, trained by Philip Hobbs, is by Kemal, a stallion who died very prematurely. He was the sire of Ryman Reason. Sandman, the sire of Sandman as well. So uh, What a loss he was to racing. Uh, Jeremy Maxwell, uh, of course, owned him in the Bally House Stud in Northern Ireland. Pleasure shared at 14 to 1 for the Phillips Hodge Yard. Yes, a pleasure, not very widely shared, but a very well-earned success. And it's his third victory in five runs this season. This 14-to-1 winner, pleasure shared, superior risk 6-to-1, Buckhouse Boy 14-to-1. It's by Kamal, as my other colleague said, out of uh, Love and a Miss by Paddy Stream. He's a 64th winner of the season with Philip Hobbs, enjoying an absolutely cracking time. And number two uh, at the meeting for... Paul Carberry, right, three brownies tomorrow, and his 37th winner of the season. Really rather tough on superior risk, having made so much of the running to finally get collared very game effort on his part but this horse just too good for him at the weights which were incidentally between them were level weights they both went off the same mark just to recap 
The starting price is as follows. And the winner, pleasure shared at 14 to 1. Second, superior risk at 6 to 1. And third, Buckhouse Boy, 14 to 1. The tote returns there. Win, £24.40. Places, £5.30. £2.90. £7. The dual forecast, £130.40. pence. And confirmation that all the horses that fell in the Fox Hunters chase, they were all unscathed. The only injury to a jockey was Tim Edwards, who damaged his ribs, falling on the first on direct. And one earlier injury to a jockey, Warren Marston, was badly shaken. His fall on Jibber the Kibber. He's missed his remaining rides today, but he hopes to be fit to ride Lusty Light tomorrow. But he's got to pass the doctor, of course, before he does that. Well, after 12 races at the meeting, this is the position in the Ritz Club Charity Trophy, which goes to the leading rider over the three days, and Tony McCoy is leading the field with three. Jonathan Lower and Paul Carberry, who's just completed <laughs> a double, have two winners, Lorcan Wire, Peter Nevin, Clive Story, Brian Harding, and uh, Richard, not Richard Fox, Richard Ford, have won. And uh, two trainers have had a couple of winners at the meeting, Martin Pipe and David Nicholson, those who have won. Uh, Tim Easterby, Thomas Tate, Howard Johnson, Jane Story, John Jenkins, Gordon w. w. Richards, Stephen Brookshaw, and Philip Hobbs. Well, we've had two great days. If you just got back from work, this is the story so far today. Very little between the leading trio now as they come down towards the final flight with Silver Shred the Grey trying to get on terms as well. But on the near side, it's Ashwell Boy who's going to jump in the lead. Ashwell Boy lands over the last in the lead from Escort Feed and then comes Silver Shred racing up towards the line. And as they come into the final hundred yards, it's Ashwell Boy being challenged all the time by Silver Shred. Silver Shred beginning to get up. And at the line, Silver Shred has got up and won it from Ashwell Boy with third escort feet. A brilliant finale that by the grey Silver Shred under Jonathan Lower. Gets up in the closing stages to win this Martel Mersey Novices Hurdle. Martin Pipe and Jonathan Lower winning the first race of the afternoon for the second day in succession. No luck though so far for the stable jockey David Bridgewater. The winner returned 12 to 1. Viking flagship has taken it up now as he comes down to the final ditch. It's Viking flagship, two from home, in the lead from the fading Colton and then Sound Man. Coming down towards the final fence now in the Mum Melling chase. And it's the old champion Viking flagship really stretching him now as he comes to the final fence. Colton is second and Sound Man finishing strongly in third. At the final fence, though, Viking flagship has surely only got to jump it. He gets a tremendous cheer from the crowd. Viking flagship as he strides away from Sound Man. And as they come to the line, Viking flagship wins the Mummelling chase. Sound Man is second, the gallant Colton is third. And the disappointing winner of the Queen Mother champion chase, Clarence Davis, is fourth. Viking flagship winning the Mum Melling Chase for the second year in succession. Tony McCoy said it was the greatest ride of his life. David Nicholson talking about three miles the next season. The winner returned five to two. Coming up to the final ditch, two out. Addington Boy from Avro Anson. One fence to jump now. Act the wag and Golden Slipper just coming to jump the second last, but at the last it's Addington Boy from Avro Anson. Addington Boy under Brown Harding from Avro Anson trying to challenge again under Marquardt. But they come down to the final fence. There's not such a big lead now. Addington Boy jumps in from Avro Anson, and it's Addington Boy from Avro Anson as they race into the closing stages. Addington Boy being challenged again by Avro Anson. It's going to be close as they come to the line. But Addington Boy has just held that challenge of Abra Ranson. Addington Boy is the winner. Abra Addington Boy winning for jockey Brown Harding there, standing in for Tony Dobbin, who's injured. A consolation for Gordon Richards, who's had disappointments with one man, and Tartan Tyrant, who can't run in the national. 
as they race down towards the final fence in the Martell Fox Hunters chase. It's a three-horse race up front, and they land almost in unison. Rolling ball is beginning to pick up again on the far side. On the near side, it's Cinderbrad out, but it's Rolling Ball who is sprinting now as they come down towards the elbow. Rolling ball it is. The leader by two to three lengths from Cinderbrad out, and then comes Sonotti and Kenny Orchid finishing like a train. It's Rolling Ball now with Kenny Orchid putting in a tremendous run over on the far side. Rolling Ball on the near side, Kenny Orchid on the far side. It's going to be close. Rolling Ball and Kenny Orchid. Rolling Ball has just won it from Kenny Orchid with Sonotti third. Four came Cinder Berlad and five the Birdo. Rolling Ball, who led from the start, was headed three quarters of a mile out, but battled his way back into the lead. A great ride by Richard Ford and a rare winning favourite at seven to two. With the second loss, superior risk and pleasure shared jumping together and pleasure shared is going on now and it's pleasure shared under Paul Carberry. Paul looking for his second winner of the meeting, looks as though he's only going to jump the last. It's pleasure shared at the last by two lengths from superior risk and as they race into the closing stages on the level, it's pleasure shared under Paul Carberry going away from the long-time leader. Superior Risk and at the line, Pleasure Shared is the winner, Superior Risk is second and third is Buckhouse Boy with just getting up to be fourth, Mr Kermit. Pleasure Shared giving Paul Carberry his second success of the meeting, remember he was hurt yesterday, had to pass the doctor to ride today. Well, the great race is just 23 hours away now. Three o'clock tomorrow, the Martel Grand National. What do you look for in a Grand National winner? Well, Jenny Pittman's been sharing some of her secrets with Sue Barker. When they're going down to beaches, it makes you ever so religious, I reckon. When they're going down to beaches for the second time, and you think you're in with a squeak, you think, God, let him jump this, I'll pack up swearing, I'll pack up smoking, I'll do anything. <laughs> I have a leg feel in hand, which is this one. I'm left-handed, and, and it, it has a very good memory. I mean, some of the old horses, when you rub your hand down their legs, they're, they're a bit like antique chair legs. They've got so many knocks and added bits onto them. You know what? The, the real good ones are the ones that have got characters. The, the very good ones, you know, are all a bit eccentric in some way or another. Just that little bit different. And you can see that special feature with Jenny Pittman and Sue Barker in Grandstand tomorrow. What else do you need to find the winner? Well, you need a list of runners and the latest betting information. And that you're going to get now from Graham Rock. And Rough Quest is now up to seven to one. There we have him, co-favourite with Superior Finish and Young Hustler. Superior Finish, Labrook's worst loser. Party politics, he knows the course better than the groundsman. Nine to one, and one of the leading fancies in the race. He's the biggest loser in the books for Hills. Lusty Light, 20 to one there. I think that you can get uh, quite a big price. You can have that 33 to one about the Jenny Pittman, one, two. On Coram Per, 20 to one from 33 to one a week ago for Martin Pipe. Antonin, biggest loser in Coral's Antipost book. Can this outsider win for Yorkshire? Chatham, another for Martin Pipe. A good horse on his day. Now we're into the land of dreams, the outsiders, 50 to 1, 66 to 1, 100 to 1. If any of these win, the bookmakers will clean up. And 50 to 1 plastic space age, a name for the day perhaps, but not perhaps the best name for a racehorse. 150 to 1.
200 to 1, three brownies, Paul Carberry in cracking form. Can he win at 200 to 1? I doubt it. And of course, Shaw Metal. He might be the outsider of the field, but he certainly wouldn't be the least popular winner, as you can see there, trained by Donald McKay. Graham, thank you. The ground's getting firmer all the time. One of the horses that's going to suit is party politics. The only previous winner in tomorrow's field. It's four years since party politics earned his moment of glory, and every year he's trained purely with the Grand National in mind. He's an old gentleman now, 12 years old, and his periodic problems with breathing and with his feet make him a challenge to train. He's the biggest horse in the race by far, 18 hands high, over six foot. He'll have fewer than 30 rivals. From an original entry of 82, the field shrunk to 32 on Monday. And by Saturday, it'll be the smallest for 26 years. He's a very light action horse to, to ride. You know, he's always on the go, as you can see. Um, some horses come up here are always falling over their feet and things. He, he, he hardly ever does that. He's a, a remarkably light action horse for a big horse. Yeah. yeah. His only race in the last 12 months was at Haydock Park, where, not surprisingly, he got tired in the heavy going and was pulled up. But since then, he's come to himself, and as the day gets closer, he gets better. But you can hear him coming from a long way away. The reason is that the horse has a stainless steel tube in his throat to help his breathing. It's fitted painlessly when he comes back into training, and it's cleaned and adjusted by his lad, Buck Rogers, before and after exercise. When he first had it in, it took him about a week to get used to it. He was kind of galloping along with his head up. But after a week, he learned to use it. And um, he really could take in the air. And he could really feel the difference. What he doesn't want is a windy day. It affects his breathing. Last time he won the national, it was election year. That could be this year. A good omen for Nick Gaisley? Well, I, I'm, I'm never confident over these things, but um, his preparation has gone well. He likes the course. He's got a great jockey. Who knows? So is he going to win? Yes. <laughs> he sounded interested. <laughs> well, Grandstand starts at 12.15 tomorrow, and as well as the Grand National, Danone takes centre stage in his bid to win the Aintree hurdle for the second year in succession. Remember, he smashed a fetlock in last year's race, only to make a miracle return. Also in Grandstand, football focus with Alan Hansen and live coverage of the final practice for the Brazilian Grand Prix. Final score at 5 o'clock. But tomorrow here at Aintree, for one man and one horse, it's going to be the day of their life. Goodbye. Is that camera running? Moving pictures is back. You're looking real good to me. With David Lynch. It's, um, you know, um, a thinking man in trouble.
Terry Gilliam. They're watching you. We're all monkeys. Susan Sarandon. Death is breathing down your neck. You're playing your little man on the make game. Around the globe, from sci-fi to the London scene, if it's moving on screen, it's in moving pictures. Tell everyone it's art. Does anyone here know how to write? No. Good. Be there. Tuesday, 11.15 on BBC Two. Let's play. Esther will be looking back over her whole series in half an hour, catching up with the surrogate mother, her baby, and the adopting parents to discover how it all worked out. First on BBC Two, it's the big day for Martin Lewis and contestants. On today's The Day.